Good evening, everyone. I'll call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome all committee members this evening and welcome everybody who's watching us on the live stream. We're glad that you're with us. The second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. Ask any member if you have one of those you'd like to declare. Seeing none, you can always declare one of those anytime you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments. We have no open forum. We have no delegations, but we do have a public meeting uh, and it's on the uh, community improvement plans. I'll just let everybody know uh, how we will run the public meeting. Uh, it would be just like a planning uh, committee uh, meeting, essentially. We'll begin with a presentation from our supervisor of development services, uh, Jay Posner, uh, following which we will hear from members of the public. I believe we do have one member of the public who wishes to address council on this this evening. Uh, and then after we've heard from that uh, individual, uh, we will take questions or comments from members of the committee. So uh, we'll get started then and uh, uh, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, if you'll indulge a few minutes, of, I'd like to go through the report in particular outline the major sections of the uh, community improvement plans uh, that are in front of you. Uh, as the, as uh, you outlined uh, the purpose of the meeting, I'll just uh, sort of the other ideas. We want to inform the public and you about what is in those the CIP, so uh, if I may. Uh, the first I will go through, and if you want to follow along with your attachments, that's fine too, are the downtown Port Elgin and the downtown Southampton community improvement plans. Uh, well, let me back up a bit. I guess I, I assume that everybody knows what a community improvement plan is, but just as a reminder, they are there to, uh, there are tools under the Planning Act that allow municipalities to, as I've identified in the report, to focus public attention on our priorities, to target areas in transition or in need of repair, rehabilitation, redevelopment, facilitate and encourage community change in a coordinated manner or to stimulate investment through municipally, primarily municipal incentive-based programs. And though all of the, uh, plans in front of you do that in general terms and in more specific terms. So I will start uh, with the Port Elgin and Southampton CIPs. And it doesn't really matter uh, which one. These two in particular are very similar. Um, and actually all the CIPs have the same introductory commentary. They go through uh, outlining the introduction and purpose of the CIPs the legislative framework that allows municipalities to undertake community improvement plans. It uh, sets out the policy in general terms of, that supports the creation of the CIPs with the provincial policy, county of Bruce and local town policy. Uh, and then it gets into more specific uh, process requirement or things that went on in the creation of both the Southampton and Port Elgin CIPs in particular, they outline in Southampton's case that the uh, Southampton Strategic Plan, the Parks and Trails Master Plan, survey of the Southampton Residents Association. And at the time that this was first uh, examined in 2012, 2013, uh, the, uh, there was a number of other municipal processes going on. There was our own official plan uh, uh, update at the time that was being undertaken. We had prepared some design guidelines uh, from with the county's assistance uh, just a few years prior, we were completing a wayfinding strategy uh, and undertaking a significant branding exercise for the, the uh, to clarify the identity of downtown Southampton and Port Elgin for that matter. Um, and then this, as, as it happens, the CIP for both Southampton and Port Elgin adopted a couple years apart, identified as I'm going through it, or enabled rather programs that could be developed in, in more detail that it would enable the town to pro provide financing for the programs identified to for businesses to make facade improvements to cover the portion of uh, costs for exterior improvements to a street facing facade or to uh, cover the cost for storefront signage or awning improvements to help with building code uh, enhancements or accessibility improvements to make the buildings more accessible for people with uh, mobility or other disabilities to encourage community energy efficiency, as it's noted here, and in in very general terms to encourage and uh, identify for uh, the town to focus uh, its resources on streetscape beautification, public parks, or uh, additional things that could help or uh, derive, as it says here, derive more economic benefits. So I, I, I use an example, maybe building a parking lot that that could also be uh, a focus of the area. 
the plan goes into more detail about how we would consider what is eligible. Uh, that's very, very detail oriented and maybe uh, I can go over it if you want. And then uh, perhaps what is, uh, uh, you know, often talked about are the specific financial incentives. And in the case of Port Elgin and uh, Southampton's downtowns, there's grant uh, financial incentives as a grant to cover part of the costs, loans, or tax uh, increment equivalent grant programs. That is, if the improvement is made and their property taxes go up, their assessed property value goes up, the town could help offset that increase by phasing in the taxes in, uh, in simple terms. Uh, so that is the downtown plans. Uh, what they also do is they enable the town to be eligible for, or town businesses to be eligible for Spruce to Bruce program funding. Uh, and Spruce to Bruce has been a program that the county has had for, well, Kara can correct me, it's been at least eight years. Uh, and they provide biz funding for small businesses for the things that we've identified in our plan, facade improvements, signage, accessibility, and so on. And uh, one of their tests is to make sure each community uh, it does have its own CIP that can help uh, the county uh, provide its Bruce to Bruce funding. Uh, that's the downtown plans. The economic development CIP uh, was recently adopted only in 2018. And at that time, it was um, based on the economic development strategic plan to look at uh, and encourage affordable housing, hotels, manufacturing, and nuclear support services. Over the intervening period, we've uh, learned a few things. One is that uh, a lot of the programs that we had set up aren't necessarily as broad as they could be. And I'll get into more detail. And secondarily, COVID happened. And a lot of the economic activities which were uh, identified in the strategic plan could be broadened more, more generally to include all economic activity, new, new businesses, business retention and expansion, uh, so forth. So uh, what I've identified in the report is the, the major changes is that we wouldn't just, we were integrating and going beyond what is in the strategic plan and to include economic activity objectives that are in our official plan. And so to, in addition to affordable housing, manufacturing, et cetera, we, as I said, uh, look at new businesses, business retention and expansion and other th things like special needs housing. Uh, there's policy to enable additional assistance programming for work such as, um, and this is in the terminology of the CIP local improvement uh, programming to help with the payment for studies uh, like environmental site remediation, building rehab, energy efficiency, uh, a proposed expansion to the property tax incentive program to allow for the rebate of municipal fees beyond just our fees, but perhaps county planning fees to extend the life of the CIP from five to 10 years, which is the legislative maximum that would allow us. So we don't have to come back every five years. We can, um, if we're happy, we can just let it be there, let it exist. And then there's various housekeeping changes to improve clarity and readability. Um, and at the time of writing, I'd only received one comment and uh, I think Jackie Roach is on the call. Her comment is summarized there and I don't wanna, um, put words in her mouth. So if she wants to provide a different uh, comment, that's fine. But I also received comment from Al Cantors who uh, identified that there, we could perhaps consider what he calls a working capital loan fund to help retail businesses with to finance the purchase of stock for their retail. Um, and uh, just providing that as a comment. And then we also received comment from the County Bruce Planning Department they made some suggestions to better align with the Spruce to Bruce uh, program specifically. And I think uh, importantly, uh, they've uh, recommended inclusion of patio improvements. So sidewalk patios are eligible under Spruce to Bruce. They're recommending that could be included as uh, policy in our CIPs. Uh, next step after this meeting is I'll listen to all the comments, any questions you have and come back with uh, revised CIPs if needed for council consideration and uh, then you will be able to adopt them and if you adopt them all it means is that the policy the programs are enabled and if there there also has to be an implementation side so we'll also come forward with uh, no promises at the very next meeting but at a very short time after with implementation with a proposed funding and ways of actually financing some of the programs uh, in more specific terms so i'll leave it there mr mayor thank you for indulging me Oh, thank you, Jay, for all of that. So we do have uh, one member of the public, I believe. It's Miss Roach. Uh, are you there? Uh, 
Jackie? Yes, we're here. Okay, do you have uh, some comments you'd like to make uh, to Council at this point? No, we really just, just wanted to uh, learn what the plan was, that's all. Because we live in the area, in the, the business area of Southampton, and there have been some changes to other things surrounding us. I just kind of wanted to know what what the plan was. So now I have some sense of it, really. That was all it was. I didn't, there were no concerns or nothing like that. There's nothing nefarious happening. Okay. Well, we didn't suspect that. Well, if there's uh, any questions, uh, I'm sure that uh, that you have uh, either now or going forward, I know that uh, Jay would be happy to, to answer any questions you have about CIPs. Uh, it was really great. When I called, he was terrific on the phone. Cheryl Grace also called me this afternoon. We had a lovely little chat. So that was, I really appreciated the outreach. Good. So I think I'm good. And I really appreciate you, you know, giving me some airtime. <laughs> Anytime. Well, thanks very much for uh, coming to the meeting. Okay, well, that's good. So uh, we've heard from Ms. Roach. Jay, there's nobody else uh, who's asked to speak to us this evening, is there? Uh, not through me. I, I don't think so. Okay. I think nobody else, Linda? No, there isn't, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So that's uh, the end of the public input then, I guess. So I guess we'll hear from members of the committee. Are there members of the committee who have questions or comments? I, oh, Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Jay. Um, I just have a couple of um, uh, questions. One is about um, the suggestion of consolidating um, both of the town's um, CIPs and um, the fact that they have lots of similarities. Um, and I'm assuming that one of the big advantages would be efficiency. Um, are there any downsides to doing this? Why, why did it evolve as two separate CIPs to begin with? Uh, well, my memory from eight, 10 years ago isn't as good, but I think, it, you know, if I, at the risk of oversimplifying, it evolved because they were pro progressing at different rates. Port Elgin, uh, the mayor will remember that Port Elgin has started, they prepared its own CIP in 2010, and then there was a greater desire to uh, not just to make sure Southampton got it, but the county was also being more per, uh, directly involved in the creation of downtown improvements. So I think the Spruce to Bruce really is what spurred on the Southampton and the Port Elgin was on its own. I think we had Walmart had come and they had given or they had been required to provide funding for this sort of exercise. Nevertheless, they ended up being very similar. And so the main advantage is uh, to consolidating is so that they are generally the same. The main, the same issues generally exist in both downtown communities. The businesses are a similar mix whether for the types that we want, retail, restaurant, so forth. And so I thought there was a value in consolidating though the ease at which they, that happens will determine, I think, whether they actually come forward as consolidated documents. I do have one more question, Mr. Mayor. Um, just the, um expanding the the life of the CIP from five to 10 years and just um, getting an assurance that there'll be ample opportunity for review and amendment if if necessary throughout that time. It's flexible enough to allow for that. Yes, it's certainly flexible. I mean, I, I think the CIP uh, for economic development is particularly flexible just on the program programs that are being identified and the types of uh, activities that we were considering being eligible. But even beyond that, the process for uh, updating and reviewing a CIP, CIP is very straightforward. It's a lot simpler than a normal planning process uh, for an official plan or even a zoning bylaw for that matter. So I think uh, even the evidence that the economic development CIP is before you tonight is is a good indication that we're willing to be flexible because we've we've looked at in only two years the difficulties in trying to support businesses and getting what they need done and are are making an attempt here to make sure you are as uh, able uh, as you can be and are willing to help them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those, those are my questions. Thanks. Okay, Thank you. Further questions as the Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was really just a comment, a quick question. Uh, a comment was, Jay, thanks so much for your uh, your fine work again. I think updating our CIP was a, was a, was a great thing to do, important thing to do. And uh, I was paid 
really close attention to uh, Article Number 11, um, 11.2 and 11.3. And, you know, I see 11 affordable housing projects at the uh, at top of the list. And I, I, that, that, that's good to see, although I, I don't think that's in any, 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 any order in particular, Jay, in terms of those numbers. That's just that housing happened to be placed at the top. Uh, is there is there a packing order if you we do get a number of applications submitted you know how how will you uh how will that be determined and and i and i guess to do with affordable housing um you know it's great to see things like development charges property tax municipal fee program local improvement charges i mean that's that could do wonders it could make the difference between you know attracting a, an affordable tenable housing development here or not and uh so these are really positive changes and i hope I hope the developers, investors are taking note uh, that the, the help is on its way and, and that this could turn out to be something, you know, really helpful to our developers to bring in more affordable and attainable housing for the town of Saugan Shores. So that question around 11-2, uh, Jay, that's, that's really in no particular order, correct? That's just uh, the way they landed? Yeah, that particular section, there's no order. Certainly council can, in its budget, uh, the deliberations can prioritize as they want. They can decide to put more money towards, uh, you know, what certain types of projects over others in any given year or any given program. Uh, the specific priority is in the item three there, 11.3, that uh, there is sort of a pecking order there. And I don't want to be too, uh, I guess, uh, maybe it's a little nuanced, but that DCs are the most and most straightforward and maybe the most impact for capital expenditures because there are charges that we control that are very much within our power to set and at whatever rate do you want. Whereas some of the other ones, property tax, we is a, say be a little lower priority because we don't know the taxes after a development's made, what the assessed value will become. So it's a little let out of our control and so on and so forth. The municipal fees, again, depends on the types of uh, applications that are required local improvement because it's such a broad term uh, a lot of type expenses with sort of more unknowing and sort of going down that list other than streamlining which doesn't have much impact on our process we're pretty streamlined community as it is it's it's still something we want to look at just a quick follow-up mr mayor J. I, you know when you get into the property tax section you know we certainly would have some control there as a municipality um, to a lesser degree i suppose bruce county taxes and to a much lesser degree, uh, the separate and public school board. So we really have no say over property taxes there, but is there is it negotiable uh, when we get to the county level, for example, when we talk about taxes for, for housing, for example, for attainable affordable housing, is that something that the town can, you know, or how does that negotiation take place? Well, rather than an answer, I think that's a good comment and we can examine that with the county. We did uh, include commentary to include uh, municipal fees, uh, including the county fees for the our application rebates as an example of something. But if we want to talk about county taxes and how that may be an eligible uh, benefit, I definitely want to look into that with the county. They didn't identify that to me, but uh, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily uh, front of mind when they were making that comment. So, well, I just want to congratulate you again, Kara. You know, this is a really good a good step forward to uh, towards you know uh, bringing in uh, housing stock for from an affordability attainability, attainability housing standpoint. So, this is a very very positive step. So, not just for uh, for housing, but for the downtowns as well. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments from members? I don't see any. Well, thanks very much uh, for this presentation, Jay. I, uh, I, uh, the CIPs are close to my heart, having played a bit of a role in the creation of the Port Elgin document years ago, and, and to see them rolled out in this way and to, and cleaned up and uh, and updated uh, is good. I think it's important. I, I do wonder about the consolidation. Uh, we should think it through as to whether it's absolutely necessary to consolidate them uh, because I think there could be the potential, not at the moment, but um, you know, if the, uh, if the situation happens to arise in the future where um, one or the other of the communities wants to incentivize something slightly different or our need is slightly different in Southampton than it is in Port Elgin, uh, for example, and we wanted to develop a different set of policies, um, it might be easier down the road rather than decoupling them uh, to just keep them separate. They are, sep they are separate um, commercial areas, right? So, um, so it, I think there's a, a good logic to having them as separate documents and uh, 
uh, unless there's some really compelling reason why this is a, a real bureaucratic nightmare to have them separate. Uh, I just think it, I don't see a lot of harm in having, keeping them that way. So that would uh, be my uh, one and only comment. But if there's nothing further, then uh, uh, there is no, uh, nothing, uh, uh, no recommendation for us to consider with this one. Is that correct, Jay? That's correct, not at this time. Okay, so that uh, brings us uh, to the end then of the public meeting. Uh, and we will move on then to item seven, reports of municipal officers and committees. And under 7.2, general government, we have a staff report on the employment lands at 300 concession six and the director of strategic initiatives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The final MHBC report is being presented this evening. The staff report coming forward from Amanda and I speaks to the high level outcomes of the MHBC planning report. The lot concept has been thoughtfully prepared and has taken to consideration approximately one to one and a half acre size lots as economic development staff have heard through local business owners who are looking to expand that that size is appropriate. Also listening to discussion um, and having discussion with the mayor's task force on economic recovery. The servicing analysis aligns with previous reports to council, suggesting approximately $4 million will be required to partially service the employment lands and this does not include municipal sanitary. The last piece of the formal report includes a market appraisal for the parcels of land, and the process included a comparative review, market review, providing an appraisal of approximately 150,000 to 175,000 per lot. So this, and this appraisal is reflective of the current market. The recommendation from staff is to proceed with planning requirements relating to the employment lands and to receive the MHBC planning report this evening. Staff anticipate future reports to council to include um, a recommendation for financial support for servicing, as well as uh, we'll be coming back to discuss and to recommend the advancement of the process regarding the declaration of surplus land. So Amanda is on is attending the meeting right now and uh, both she and I can answer any questions you have. All right, thank you. I'll read the recommendation, then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that Council receive the MHBC planning report regarding the development of the employment lands at the address of 300 Concession 6, Sogging Shores, and direct staff to continue to advance the development in general conformity to the recommendations within this report. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Uh, Councilor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I know we're significantly along in the planning process here with the uses for this uh, Lamont purchase property. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, express my opinion on this. And, and perhaps it can be explained to me. And I know, I know there was a committee struck to, to look at, uh, at the Ball Diamond development and the sports park development, and now the municipal land portion of it. But it, it just occurs to me that, um, that we seem to have it backwards. We're, we're putting the, the jewel of the development, which is the sports park with the ball diamonds and the, uh, you know, play fields and eventually uh, restaurants and concessions and things like that uh, with the lighting. We're putting it in the, in the back where people can't see it on what is now a gravel bed. And we're taking the road frontage area, the high visibility area for people coming into our community uh, along concession six and we're putting the industrial park out there it just and i and i live on that road so i drive by there virtually every day probably several times a day and every time i drive by it just occurs to me we're going to hide the the jewel of the project way off in the back of the gravel pit where nobody's going to see it except perhaps uh the tower lights and the the glow in the horizon and we're going to put the industrial lots out on the front. And furthermore, when it does come time to service those industrial lots with sanitary sewer, because uh, in the eventualities of time, we're gonna have to, to bring the sanitary sewer out there, uh, you're a lot closer if you put it next to the rail trail, across the rail trail from Walmart in the bottom of the pit, than another half a kilometer up the road. You have to go past all the, and perhaps even under the ball diamonds and tear them up. And, and thirdly, we're, we're taking an area that's currently um, agricultural and, and it has a good base of topsoil and is currently very fertile land. 
and we're going to strip the fertility off of the top of it. And then next to it, we have a land, a piece of land that is essentially stripped of its gravel resources down to bedrock. And we're going to refertilize that and put soil and, and infrastructure and, 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 uh, and irrigation down on there to return that to greenfield. It's just ever since we've been talking about this project and I have not been involved in the committee work and I have not been involved. It just seems to me we've got it backwards. We're putting the, we're putting them in the wrong place. You, you should put your industrial complexes in your, and your, uh, uh, and your industrial lots in the backyard and you put your uh, water fountain and your nice, uh, your nice landscaping out in the front yard where people can see it. And, and I, just, I don't know, I know it seems like we're going to award a contract here today, later on to proceed with the ball diamond replacement. And we're probably well on down that trail and, and much too late to do anything, but no shovels have been put in the ground yet. And I just, like I said, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't express my opinion. And it's an opinion that's shared by the residents of this part of town, the people that live along this road, my neighbors and I who use this road on a regular basis that we're gonna be driving by a, a industrial development and somewhere off in the distance in the back, there's a, there's a ball diamond that we're spending uh, four or $5 million to develop. So that's my opinion. And I don't expect you're gonna, uh, reverse the order of things here tonight, but that is my opinion. And uh, I just thought I'd express it. And I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that or if anybody thinks there's any, uh, any merit in that, but those are my words. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Further comments from members? Uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, uh, Jessica, this is a great plan. We've waited a while for this. Um, just looking at the, the uh, lot sizes and, and values and stuff. Will our economic development uh, group, you and your staff, be looking at the marketing of all this? Will you be, how are you going to be getting it out there, producing the pamphlets to get out to the people? Um, how are we going to, how are you looking at marketing this? Are you going to come back to us with another report for that? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So we have had, um, this kind of south end development in conversation for the last couple of years. So I think that's a good news. I want to start with that comment where, um, you know, local businesses who are looking to expand, we have said, hey, this is coming. You know, we, we have to get our ducks in a row. And, and COVID, right, was a bit of a hold, a pause on this project, but we're here now. So we have talked about this. Um, I also know that there are nuclear suppliers who have also looked at this and are learning about this as an option. Um, so I'm very confident that yes, marketing is required. Yes, branding is required to align with our economic development branding. Um, but I, I'm not um, sure right now as to how full-fledged that marketing plan will be. I do think that you will see more of this in our invest materials and you can look forward to a report coming forward. We are doing some work on that. So we'll be looking forward to sharing that probably by the end of April with council. Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wonder, uh, can, could Jessica or Amanda or both um, maybe provide a comment in response to Councillor Mayette's questions about the, the placement. That would be helpful to me. Thanks. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll pass it to Amanda, certainly on this one. I haven't been involved in some of the early discussions regarding the property. Sure, and my only comment will be that uh, when we did the rec lands, we had two public meetings about the proposal to go through that planning process. And this wasn't um, an item that was debated through council or um, voted on differently. So staff recommended the use for the rec lands as what as um, is proposed currently in the employment lands here uh, through those two public meetings. And since it was approved by council and county council, uh, we just continue to move forward. Maybe the director of community services has a comment. Uh, certainly, yes, I'd like to provide some input to that as well. Um, I can share with you that through our discussions with the location for the ball diamonds is that 
the the lands that have been selected are prime and great lands to to host a ball complex in. The natural berms that surround the uh, the uh, ball the proposed ball diamonds will be perfect for spectator viewing, and potentially can offer some other um, opportunities for other recreational pursuits within that area. So, uh, I can appreciate your your comments, Councillor Mayette, uh, but I can also assure you that those proposed lands are ideal for ball. Um, play, uh, as well as for sunsets. The berms that surround the, uh, the diamonds will add to the uh, complexities that we uh, inherit with sunsetting during ball games as well. So there will be, it's advantageous that they'll assist with some of that sunset uh, um, that people tend to get in their eyes when the ball's going out when the sun's going down. So hopefully that answers that question a little bit more, but it is ideal. And uh, as you will see the, uh, the logistics and the, how the diamonds will be situated within that footprint um, will be uh, uh, very much appreciated by the users within that area. Okay, thank you. Are there further comments? Uh, Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment. Um, so I, I, I support this plan. Um, it's a big investment, but I think it will pay off, um, not just with uh, the sale of the lots, uh, but also with the um, increased employment opportunities, diverse increased employment opportunities, I think, are there as well. And, um, and then we'll, we'll get continued property tax and user fee um, uh, revenue from that as well. So um, I, th I think it's a, a good plan and a good report. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments from members? Councillor Smith and then Councillor Carr. Thank you and through you. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Grace's comments in that this is a, an investment that uh, though I, I assume will take several if not many years to recoup our initial investment, uh, we will see the economic downturn uh, trickled throughout not only in, in property taxes from business levies, but also from uh, properties that may be purchased or, or built from the businesses that are brought into our community and, and the, uh, the extra revenue that will be brought into Siding Shores. Uh, I support this plan and it's something that we have been working towards and I'm excited to uh, see this come to fruition. Thank you. Councilor Carr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, it's, I guess probably towards Jessica here. Um, I know that you have just received this report, but I'm wondering, um, I guess maybe some of the expected costs in developing the land, how recently they were actually updated. Um, talking to local contractors and stuff, but I, I'm talking to people in here and that since November of last year till this time, they're seeing upwards of a 60% increase. Um, and that, yeah, 60%, I asked them a few times on that, there's been some major, major increases in everything from the infrastructure stuff in the ground to all the building materials we can't get. I guess so my first question would be is how relevant these price, this price actually is at this time. And I realize that I, I, we will see a, a few more reports I'm assuming come forward here with uh, funding, how we're gonna fund this. Um, cause if, you know, the lots don't sell as quickly as we're hoping, you know, cause I guess when I read that too, they've appraised these lots at 150 to 175, if I understood that correctly, but it might cost us 235 a lot to do. Is that, I'm understanding that properly there. So we are gonna be a little while getting our money back on that. Is there a possibility that if we do see big expenses overrun there, that it's gonna limit our borrowing capacity for future big projects that we're looking at that we know that aren't too far off on the horizon that we don't wanna see something like this start to take away from other big projects? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm going to try to touch on all those. As you were speaking, I, I thought, okay, I can answer that. I can answer that. The first one, though, and I'll pass it to Amanda in a second. Uh, Amanda and I did have this discussion around cost because you are absolutely right. We're seeing this this um, incredible inflation on cost right now. So I am going to pass that to Amanda just in one moment. Um, and then in regards to the debt financing, we are in discussion right now with our peers in finance, uh, with Sue and with Dan, to talk about that. And uh, you are correct with the the perhaps of, you know, how we will fund it. And I will remind, we did put this application into the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, and that could be upward of 1.5. 
So that application would help us greatly if we're successful in that program. So I do appreciate there's a lot of moving parts in regards to the debt financing and the cost of this project. Um, so I will acknowledge that. And what we will see in a future report is some background information um, with support from Daniel and Sue to help us understand the debt financing, that capacity. Um, but I will pass it to Amanda now if she can speak to some of these uh, cost estimates that we're seeing for servicing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Jess. Uh, uh, Councillor Carr, if you recognize the term a class D cost estimate, that's what this is. So it's a high level 20 to 30 percent uh, discrepancy sort of expectation when it comes to these numbers. But when we went back through, I took the numbers that we're seeing for reconstruction right now and Greenfield and um, what my peers in Waterloo Region are seeing. And so this cost relates to about $3,500 a linear meter, which is what they're seeing um, out in the area. Plus, we don't have sanitary sewers in this. Um, so when you add that, plus the earthworks in that in, I think we're in a good state to say that we're in a reasonable amount. So with the $4 million, uh, that does take into account a 20% contingency in there. So I think we're close. Um, the other benefit is because it's a U-shaped property and it's just water main um, and ditches, we could actually build it in stages. So if we see that the construction's coming in high, we can build it as the lots develop. So just say someone wants to build a lot on the west side, we could build, build half the road on the west and put a turnaround at the end and then come back in a, a few years when we, if the lots sales um, stall and then come back from the east and build again and connect. Okay. Okay, further questions uh, from members. Uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor and then I'll get to uh, Councilor Grace. Yeah, just to comment again, and uh, Jessica and uh, staff, uh, Amanda, it, it's a fabulous report. And take a look at our current, you know, business park that was uh, built out some 20 years ago. Now, I just about filled. I think there's one empty lot in there, and uh, this sets us up well for the future for the next 10, 15 plus years. Um, you know, to uh, to house some some new business, small manufacturers, uh, whatever we decide to uh, permit to be built out there, and. Councillor uh, Smith said it really well, and, and Councillor Grace, and I was going to report on tonight too, and I just echoing the thoughts that, you know, it's, yes, it's costing 3.4 million, I think I read, to develop, but the, but the value of it is 4.1 million once built out, and, and it's just not that 4.1 million we're recovering. Councillor Smith indicated earlier, it's, it's the new jobs created in the industrial park. It's, it's the new housing developments, uh, housing sales that happen around the town of Saugeen Shores that creates new assessment for our tax base. So it's just, it's a win-win. It's going to take some time to recover those, those initial costs, but it's something we have to do as a municipality is uh, we're, we're, our space is getting filled up. So um, it, it, it's, it's an it's incredibly a positive development for our community. And and let's, uh, Graham Bruce and further abroad know that, you know, we're open for business in our business park uh, soon. And so uh, we'll recover these costs, I think, and recover them in spades. And um, so it's a really a positive, a positive thing happening in our community. So thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just one uh, clarification question on the cost of the lots um, or the price to pre-service. Um, the price to pre-service each lot at 235,000, that's based in a, on a combination of lots that would be one to two acres in size. Is that right? I think I'm looking at the report. It's, so some of the lots could be two acres and some of them could be one acre. So that might, you know, kind of, when I was reading that, I was thinking, well, that evens out that assessment or that um, assessment at 150 to 175 per acre. That may help a bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right, yeah, Councilor Mayat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I, I think uh, just when Cheryl was making those comments about the size of the lots, you have to consider that when, when a, a potential business buys one of those lots, they have to buy it knowing that a certain percentage of that land is going to be used for a septic bed. That they can't, the fill, the fill rate of the lot won't be same as it would be for a serviced lot, say at the at the park across from the Plex, because uh, because you have to lay, you know allocate land for for the the leaching bed to to evaporation and all those things. So 
uh, when you're buying a one acre lot, really you're probably getting the equivalent of three quarters of an acre lot because you've got to allow all that extra land for, because the land, they're not fully serviced lots, which for an industrial park, I think for, to me, that's an unusual thing to have for, for zoned, for things like auto body repair and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, I hope that we never get into a situation where uh, we have contaminated beds because of that. But um, certainly we've got a broad spectrum of the type of businesses that are being allowed in here. And uh, to have them all on, sanit on septic beds is, I think, unusual. Maybe uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know GM Blue Plan says that this is within the within the code, the building code, to have this, but um, it, it seems odd and somehow yeah. wrong to me. Yeah. Perhaps Amanda or uh, Jessica make a comment about whether it's unusual and and how it uh, mm -hmm. how um, advisable it is. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll ask Amanda if she has comments. I just wanted to share, um, Councillor Mayette, a, a good example that I've learned through this process is in Georgian Bluffs, uh, Jason Street, which is in Springmount. So coming in from, from Sogging Shores, if you go left at Springmount, on your next right, there's a, a big area of land there. And those developments, that development, that employment land, uh, industrial park, those are all on septic. They're not on municipal sanitary. And in that park, you'll find there is, they're low water users. Uh, there is a bit of a storage facility, outdoor storage um, and store, heated storage building. There is a vet clinic. There are a number of builders. Um, so, you know, entre local entrepreneurs have opened up business there. There is an auto body shop that I have been to and uh, auto repair shop there. So there are a number of businesses in there and I, I drove through there recently reflecting on the size, thinking about this property, thinking about the uses that are happening on Jason Street and Georgian Bluffs. Um, and um, I, I like that example because it is connected to the size, but the use that, that we may be finding in our employment lands as well. Okay, Amanda. And to add to that uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, two items, one, when it comes to what can connect to a septic bed, the building code is pretty specific and auto shops can't connect to a sanitary sewer, so they can't connect to a uh, septic bed either. So there definitely are restrictions and, and rules and uh, inspections for those um, uses. When it comes to the green space that's required for septic beds, so we have a minimum landscaped area requirement in the zoning. And one of the things that we'll look at through the zoning bylaw amendment is a specific number. But we as engineer and the engineering group went back and did a calculation on maximum building coverage, parking lot size and um, green space. And we believe that 10% is close to what you would need on a one acre site. Um, there's also the ability to do a tertiary system. So if somebody wants to max out their parking lot and have a um, specialized septic system that doesn't have the same classic bed, then that would be an option for them to use as well. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions or comments? I might just make a comment. The, um, you'll have seen later in the agenda, I shared with you uh, the county's good growth discussion paper. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but you should, if you haven't, there's some very interesting information in there. And um, one of the interesting things, a couple of interesting things I drew out about Sogging Shores is one, um, we have in Sogging Shores, 58% of all of the land that's in some stage of the planning process for housing in the county, almost 60% of all places where you can build a house at some point in, in Bruce County is here. Um, but over the planning period, uh, the next 25 years, we will end up at negative 16 hectares of employment lands. In other words, we're, we're gonna be short uh, employment lands by about 16 hectares over the next 25 years. We need employment lands, bottom line. Uh, we, are, we have a huge amount of places to put people to live. We're gonna, we are going to grow at a rate that is substantially faster than any other community in the county. Uh, and we're going to need employment opportunities for all those people. We're going to need services to support them. Uh, and that's why we need employment lands. And one of the great things about this development is it's employment lands in the hands of the municipality, which means that um, our incentive is not necessarily, well, it isn't to make a profit at this. Our incentive is to make our money back. Uh, and but primary the municipality's primary incentive is to get businesses into town, uh, and so having these lands in our hands uh, and with our ability to 
sell them out and uh, offer them up to businesses. I think uh, streamlines the process for businesses who may be looking to come to our community. Uh, they can uh, sort of uh, one-stop shop. If you like, come to us. We want to get this business going. We can offer the land. We can take them through uh, our community improvement plan and all these other things and connect them to the opportunities that are in our community and get that done relatively quickly at a relatively low cost. Uh, so it's, um, I think, a really uh, great opportunity for our community and a really uh, um, and and striking at a at a really important need that we're going to have over the next 20 odd years to get employment lands developed. So, so I'm keen to see this move forward through the zoning process, get these employment lands up and running. Uh, the one comment or question, I guess it's a half comment, half question, I would ask is about that zoning, uh, and we have some recommendations in here about zoning. Uh, talking about zoning at light industrial, um, and there's a list of uses uh, in that zone, but some also some comments about how uh, we probably should be considering a broader range of uses than just what's available in the light industrial zone. And I just wonder, I'm hoping that our planning staff and, and you folks on the line here now are looking at a way of coming up with some permissive wording uh, for the zoning bylaw that doesn't require us to enumerate absolutely every potential use so that if veterinary clinic isn't in the list, then you can't do it, uh, you know, or, or bus parking isn't on the list, then you can't do it, right? I mean, it's, that's, we'll never, we can never envision every possible use. So I'm hoping you guys will come up with some words that say, you know, we want this to be in general industrial space um, with some parameters and anything that fits in that sort of sphere uh, can work. I mean, is that what we're working toward? Yep. And I can respond to that, Mr. Mayor. So we do have a meeting this week with uh, county planning staff to to really end with Jay Posner and Amanda as well to to discuss um, what we see as opportunity on these employment lands and certainly recognizing the low water use um, being a target, but being open to innovative and, and new um, practices as well. Yes, good. All right. Well, that uh, I think brings us to the end of that discussion. Then you've heard the recommendation. So I'll ask all in favor. Opposed? That's carried. All right, that moves us then on to the second staff report, which is on the video surveillance policy and the clerk. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. This report recommends updating the town's video surveillance policy that was created in 2008. The current policy is specific to the Cenotaph Park and is administered by the police chief. Since the adoption of the original policy, there have been specific areas that have experienced vandalism, and during our budget deliberations, funding was allocated to purchase three cameras, one for the Portogon Harbor and two uh, in areas of concern on the rail trail. And this policy is a requirement prior to installing the cameras in those locations. The policy states that the video surveillance cameras will only be installed based on verifiable reports of incidents of crime, specific and significant safety concerns or for crime prevention and only would be installed when necessary or where necessary. Um, when the cameras are installed, signs must be posted in prominent locations that are under the video surveillance area. The policy outlines the responsibility of the staff who are required to adhere to the policy and it outlines what the circumstances the videos can be reviewed, who can view the video and that the personal information is gathered under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. The video will be retained for 30 days. And if no request is received to view the video, the video will be deleted. Um, so the policy is there for your consideration and I welcome any questions to the report. Thank you very much. I'll read the recommendation then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council approve the video surveillance policy. Questions or comments? Holy smokes, all right. Uh, I will start with the Vice Deputy Mayor and work my way around. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I just, it was really a shout out to you, Linda, and particularly Tracy Edwards. I know, I know Tracy did a tremendous amount of work on this, on this new, on this revision, this policy, and I uh, just wanted to send a, you know, thank you out to her. And uh, I, I think that, you know, and you mentioned a key point that very verifiable areas where we know that there's vandalism happening and, you know, I know there's maybe some members around this table perhaps that aren't, aren't big on surveillance cameras, but uh, I, I, I do support them. I, I think that in areas where we know there's there are problems in our community, uh, it's important to put them up. 
and uh, for example, the uh, Memorial Gardens for Southern Rail Trail. I, it's just got damaged badly over the last uh, a few on several occasions. So um, I think this is the right thing to do. And if you know that the specific areas where there's problems, I remember back in the Port Augusta Cenotaph days. I know the skate park hadn't been built yet. I understand that. But once we put, but once we put those, you know, those cameras in there, the, the vandalism stopped, and we built a skate park. But uh, you know, it, it just was a, a good example of how they how they can and do work. And uh, I think there's a, a place, uh, you know, in time for those for the cameras. And this is a uh, this is a really good update. So thank you again, Linda, and, and thanks to Tracy. All right, thank you. I think I saw Councillor Grace. Sorry, there. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to our clerk's department for updating the policy. Um, I know that there have been significant changes in provincial laws and policies, uh, and, and I know it was a lot of work. Um, and with the recent examples of vandalism that we've seen the last couple of years at the rail trail and our parks property properties, um, I, I hope that um, piloting the use of surveillance in these locations will be an effective deterrent. Um, I, I'm also satisfied that there's a policy, that this policy balances uh, the public's important right to a reasonable expectation of privacy um, with our community's important need for public safety. And I also want to thank Chief Zettel and our Community Services Department for their um, assistance on this initiative. Okay, thank you. I saw Councillor Mayette just now, and then I'll get Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Aaron, through you. Um, I, I also uh, would like to congratulate the clerk's office for the significant amount of work that went into doing this, putting this report together. And, and it does highlight a number of the legislative changes that were made by the Privacy Commission uh, since 2008, I believe, was the last revision to that. But um, I won't lie, I'm, I, I have some significant concerns about this. And, and being the chair of the Police Services Board, I did consult with the chief of police on this. And and there's no doubt that uh, that from a policing point of view, there are advantages to catching crime in the act with video. It, uh, it leads to conviction more rapidly. And, uh, and I mean, there's nothing better than video evidence. Although these days you don't know what's real and what's not real on video with uh, the technology catching up and deep fakes and all that. But that aside, um, I think the world has changed. And, and we're, you know, larger cities and centers and certainly um, international areas that are prone to significant crime, i.e. Uh, terrorism or, uh, you know, severe acts of, of demonstrations and violence as we saw it uh, on January the 6th in the U.S. and places like that. There's a lot of justification for video surveillance on a continuous basis, but we're in sogging shores here. And we have from time to time incidents of vandalism, spray paint, and, and the vice deputy mayor quoted the, the Memorial Gardens in Southampton, which by the way, was solved with video evidence, but it wasn't video evidence using installed cameras. It was some of the peers of the individuals who were doing the, violent, the, the vandalism videotaped them doing it. And those videos were put on Facebook and other social media platforms and the police ended up catching them that way. And I hope I'm not uh, broaching any confidentiality with that information, but that is true. And, and I know that we've had in the past at the airport, uh, a couple of instances of tampering with airplanes and we've had the odd, uh, I would say hooliganism, but have we broached the realm or the barrier or the, the level of where we need to be considering putting in video surveillance on a continuous basis in other areas of our, our town. And, and I, I can't help think that we're not there yet. We're still, we're a small town and we're, we have neighbors we can trust. We have community watch programs. We have, uh, we have lots of other ways that criminals and hooligans are apprehended. I know uh, I take care of the fishing hatchery at the town pond. And I hope I'm not also uh, letting any secrets out, but we put up dummy cameras down there because we had a couple of incidents of, of vandalism. And so we bought the off of, I bought them off of like Amazon, they got a little red blinking light on them and they look a little like a little dome. 
and we installed them and then put a sign a sticker on the window saying video surveillance dummies we're not videoing anybody but it it helped right so you know that when you read the website from the privacy commissioner it cites a lot of justification and the benefits of video surveillance and whether the benefits of video surveillance outweigh the reduction in privacy in their use and let's be let's be clear when you're putting up video surveillance what you're doing is you're collecting personal information whenever you collect a person's race uh, their gender their personal appearance that is personal identifiable information and it has to be treated very very carefully in the eyes of the law and uh the you know the the idea that you're being potentially watched even though when you read the report only certain circumstances and certain conditions that those videos can be viewed or monitored on a continuous basis or when the information can be used is very restrictive does the public generally understand that and i don't think so i think i think the and the quote a quote from the site is the feeling of being watched and monitored on a con by the continuous gaze of video surveillance may have a chilling effect on law-abiding individuals, causing them to alter their behavior and limit their expression of their rights. This is a real thing. We, we live in an age where we are being monitored on our, on our electronic devices, on our movements, on our things that we search out, things that we click. Sometimes I think maybe even Siri or, or Alexa is listening to our conversations because it, it's an age of, of continuous monitoring. And this is just another step down that road. And, and, and I, we're probably going to approve this. I, I don't think I'm, I'm changing too many people's minds, but I'm, I'm not comfortable with moving further down this road. And, and the, one of the parts that I'm least comfortable with is the fact that the admin, we're turning over the keys to the, to the use of this tool to the administration. There are, we are the council of Saugeen Shores and we are the ones that are the people, the citizens have put here to make sure that their rights are not infringed upon by the government. And, uh, and I think by just saying the, uh, the administrator or the, the council, not the council, but who, the person, the, the, the director of the program can decide I suppose when there's a request, if some user group says that their gardens or their park was vandalized, they can decide when is it appropriate and when it is not, when is it appropriate to use it, when it's appropriate to use it, when it's appropriate to erase it. I think this tool should be used very, very carefully and it should be used in consultation with whoever is sitting around this council table in future years. Because um, I, just, I just don't think it's something that we can turn over to the administration and like I said, I, I'm on the police, I'm the chair of the police board and the police would like nothing more. I won't say it that way. The police have acknowledged that this is a use, this would be a useful tool. And that certainly the police chief was consulted on the development of this program and he is in favor of this program. That doesn't make me any more comfortable with big brother watching in our public parks and public places. If there's a incident takes place, if we have a rash of vandalism on a scale that, and, and in an area that is uh, like say at the airport, say somebody's plane was significantly damaged or, or we had one of our municipal buildings uh, significantly damaged then and, and on a regular basis. And this was a trend. I could see where, okay, let's move forward with this. But just to say we can put up cameras in a park or at a intersection or, it's not sitting comfortable with me and, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's just, I'm not in a comfortable place turning over the keys to this program to an administration and ramping up a program that I don't think we're there yet. We're not downtown Toronto. We're not London, England. We're not Paris. We're not Brussels. We're not Washington, DC. We're soggy and shorts. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I had Councillor Smith and then I'm going to get Councillor Schreider. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor, I do have a uh, pointed question for the clerk with regards to uh, whether the situation would be applicable. Um, this year, as most of you would be well aware, the Port Elgin BIA uh, 
invested in considerable decorations for the Coulter Parquet Christmas and uh, and had requested to use video surveillance to ensure that that uh, those decorations didn't walk away in the night. Uh, obviously, this this process was not in place at the time, uh, and thus spent we spent even an, even more money, uh, literally bolting those decorations and chaining them to any surface that we could uh, to prevent any. Um, to deter rather people from taking those decorations. So um, with that, I, I have one pointed question to the clerk. Would that situation warrant uh, as expressed in the document um, approval to use surveillance? Okay, and thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the policy indicates that staff are gonna work collaboratively to look at each scenario. So my answer is going to be my um, own kind of professional opinion without consulting with the rest of the staff. But in that particular case, um, that was that would be kind of preventive. So what I would like to see, what the policy is encouraging is that, the, is there a verifiable report of incidents in this particular case that you've uh, mentioned at Coulter Parquet? No, not to my knowledge anyway. There, it, um, has there been any safety concerns um, identified? Um, based on the way you explained it, no. Um, so then that would lead us to the requirement, does it uh, meet for crime prevention? And when we look at crime prevention, my thought process goes to, is there any other ways that we can mitigate the concerns of possible um, vandalism? So can we increase lighting? Can we increase police patrols, that type of thing? And then when we narrow it down that, okay, we've looked at all possibilities, only then would a video surveillance camera be warranted, in my opinion. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I do have a follow-up. Uh, so obviously there's an expense uh, that Councillor Mayette has expressed both socially and uh, quite literally, there would be an expense to these cameras and expense for staff time to, to review the footage, but uh, countering that with the expense that would be put in place with these counter mechanisms that you've described and the ones that, that were in this case used, um, chains and such and locks and increased police presence and, and all of that was done this year, but at considerable expense, uh, both in time and effort. Um, so I would, uh, you know, if, if this situation, if th this does pass this evening and we are able to go forward with security or surveillance uh, next year, I, I would be requesting, and I know the BAA would be requesting usage of this policy. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can come to terms on that if this does pass. Uh, I, I would like to address some of the points that Councillor Mayette has raised in terms of information that is collected and, and the the time in which we live, um, of all of the information that the administration collects of our individual citizens, uh, there is a vast amount of information that is accessible to the administration that is protected by uh, the laws in which you have described and that is monitored in such a way. Um, I think of uh, something as simple as my children registering for swimming lessons. There is information that I am forced to key enter into that is now housed in a database at the control of the administration uh, that quite frankly I would be much more or less inclined to want in the hands of someone than I would an image of me walking down the street. Um, so I would counter that we have a very um, uh, knowledgeable staff that is protected by policies that prevent using this in a negative context. Uh, but that if we can put processes in place that would protect the dollars that our citizens invest in us through their taxes, I think that it is uh, a way in which we can help prevent that going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Schreider. Thank you, and through you, um, I, I support the policy for sure. I know that um, working with some of the community groups where vandalism has occurred, that um, whether this is used to help um, catch those that have taken place or if there is security issues um, or to act as a deterrent, then I'm all for it. Um, I, I do understand that we are still a, a small town, but we're still a growing town and, and we are seeing over the last few years um, is that some, some of those issues that we haven't seen before are creeping into our, our municipality. And I think anything that we can do to help keep it as safe as possible, um, I would support that for sure. Um, I do understand the concerns that some do have um, with regards to privacy, but much like Councillor Smith had said, um, I think that um, this policy, much like 
a lot of other personal information, confidential information is in good hands with our administration. Um, you look at things like uh, an FOI, um, things like, like what Councillor Smith had, had talked about as well is that we deal with confidential, not we, our administration deals with confidential information on a daily basis, um, probably far more than what we do. Um, so I think it is in very good hands and, and I trust staff with this. I think it's a great policy, looking forward to um, implementing this throughout our facilities and parks where it's needed. Okay, thank you. I think I had Councillor Grace next. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a, a couple of, um, of points, um, maybe to explain why I think, why I approve of this policy in terms of um, an expectation of privacy. Um, my understanding of, of the general sort of legal definition of what a reasonable expectation of privacy is that, that people, um, that the law recognizes that there are various zones of privacy uh, that a, an ordinary person would expect. So that your expectation of privacy in your home is significantly greater than it would be in your car moving around. And your expectation of privacy in your personal car would be greater than being in a public park. Um, so that if I don't think it's reasonable, most I don't think that the law and I don't think most people would say that it's reasonable to expect a great amount of privacy when you're in a public setting. Um, like a park. Um, so that, that's part of my, my thought. Um, the other thing is that I think the, that Linda has explained that um, the process shows that there would, that, that these um, surveillance cameras wouldn't just be placed around willy nilly throughout the municipality. Um, they would be placed in areas after there had been um, a demonstrated pattern of a need for that. So for instance, in the Memorial Gardens uh, over the last two summers, uh, maybe three, I can think of pretty egregious examples of, of um, vandalism, not just the, the spray paint incident, um, but also uh, you know, examples of, of somebody taking and gouging out chunks out of um, expensive furniture that, that um, had been purchased and placed in there for the comfort of the public. Um, and uh, destruction of um, sets of tools used to repair bikes and, and so forth. There are a number of examples of that. Um, spray painting, um, you know, the walls inside the new gazebo. So um, I, I'm satisfied uh, that our our um, administration will handle this very responsibly and respectfully in terms of the public um, public's uh, right to privacy. And that's my reason for supporting the plan. Thank you. Okay, are there further comments? Well, some good uh, discussion there. You know, as a uh, member of council uh, with a sterling reputation and or record, I should say, for uh, supporting uh, the uh, ideas brought forward by Director Mike Myatt in his time as uh, Director of Community Services. This is the one blemish on that uh, on that record uh, was over video, video surveillance. Uh, and uh, I've always been squeamish about uh, video surveillance. Uh, and uh, But as we made our way through the budget, uh, I was content to uh, support that uh, particular item moving forward uh, on a pilot uh, basis to see, to experiment really, to see whether um, these will have a deterrent effect uh, on crime in these specific areas. I um, remain skeptical, but will be pleased to be proved wrong because uh, I don't want uh, that vandalism to continue uh, any more than anybody else does. I guess where I have difficulty with the policy is this uh, section seven, and I will say, that um, you know, I have absolute confidence in our staff that they will implement whatever policy we pass uh, in detail and exactly as we pass it. And this is uh, in response to uh, Councillor Mayette's concerns. This is where we are involved as a council. We create the policy, uh, we decide how it will be done, and then staff will do it. And uh, and in my experience, I've never experienced a situation where staff uh, um, failed in that effort to do what uh, council directed them to do. So, but. In saying that, this section seven, um, 
offers an awful lot of leniency. If, if our intention here is to target crime, where we have crime happening, vandalism or other types of serious crime, um, then I don't understand why we wouldn't limit access to video surveillance equipment records uh, for situations where there's an incidence of a crime having been committed. But instead, we have this big list of things we can, it can be access to enhance the safety and security of employees, the public, corporate assets, uh, preventing unauthorized activities involving town property, uh, assessing the effectiveness of safety and security measures, um, providing evidence as required to protect the town's legal rights, whatever that means. I mean, we've, we essentially, we've created a, a list here that will allow access to these records for just about anything. I mean, there's nothing that couldn't be allowed or wouldn't be allowed in that list. Staff will follow it, they'll do it just as written, but, but they can but recognize they can access these records for just about anything. I, I, my, my understanding of what we talked about during the budget was that we wanted, when a crime was committed, vandalism or another serious crime to have a record of that uh, so that we could prosecute those people, which is what we want, or alternatively, to, or just passively to prevent that crime from taking place in the first place. Uh, but if a crime is committed, I'm completely in support of accessing the video log to catch the criminals. But I'm not super in favor of accessing the video records to assess the effectiveness of safety and security measures or to prevent unauthorized activities upon or involving town property. That could be anything, not necessarily something unlawful, just something that the director doesn't like. Uh, so, so I, can't, I, and I can't support the policy. I, I think it's too permissive. The other thing I'm concerned about is MFIPA. I mean, there's a section in here on MFIPA where uh, folks can access these records through MFIPA. We've created this long list of reasons why we can access the record so why is it that, so why wouldn't it be then that somebody in the public could access the records for the same reason? For example, investigating an incident involving a potential or active insurable claim against the town. Okay, so that's, we could use it to defend ourselves. Why couldn't somebody use MFIPA to access a video record of themselves uh, tripping in a pothole on the rail trail and use it to sue us? They could, and they could do, and there's a number of things in here preventing unauthorized activities upon town property. You know, they, there's all sorts of access because we've enumerated this long list of things where we open ourselves to, to accessing these records through MFIPA. Now I understand MFIPA protects the privacy of people pretty uh, aggressively, but if it's yourself in the video, I think you'd have a pretty good shot at claiming it, particularly if the town says that's what they're gonna use the, the document for in the first place. So I think that there's like, I, so my issue is with section seven. I would be content to, to vote for the policy if it said the reason why you can access a video surveillance equipment record is if, a, if there's evidence a crime was committed uh, and we need to find out who did it. I can't, that's the only reason in my view why we should be accessing these records, not to, not to investigate all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with breaking the law. Uh, so, um, so that's my reason for voting against it. My preference would be to send it back. I'll vote for it if we could get it adjusted, uh, but I would prefer to send it back and have that pared down significantly so that I can say to the public, this is what this is there for. It's not there to study you. <laughs> it's there, if you break the law, you better bet we're looking at this, can this video record, but we're not looking at it for any other reason. So those are my thoughts. Councilor Schreider's got a rebuttal. Councilor Schreider. Uh, thank you, and through you, and I, and I just wonder if maybe there's a bit of clarification and whether this is uh, for Linda tonight or, or if it does come back, whichever, um, but um, when, it, when we view it, so we being staff, when we view when an incident occurs, that becomes a record, and then what the retention period on that record would be is when we keep it for. If the evidence or, or a, a clip, if you will, does not get viewed, it's not a record. I, I don't believe anyway, Linda could provide comment on that. Um, the reten or the, the cycle of, of, of the footage that is kept is, is 30 days. Sorry, I don't have the, the policy open in front of me. If it's 30 days, is that, the, is that a concern? So when we have an incident that occurs, we know that generally within probably 24, 48 hours, we would be going and looking to retrieve that, what we'll, what we'll call as a record. Um, but if that period of 30 days is too long and people are uncomfortable with that, 
Um, could it be shortened down to 15? And I don't know what the right answer is. I like the policy. I'm not, I'm not arguing with it, but maybe Linda could provide a bit of comment on actually what constitute a record. Yes, and through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the councillor is absolutely correct. It's only the record only is generated if it's viewed for that purpose. Um, so the video, if it's if there's not an incident, then the video would not be reviewed, and it could be deleted. And the policy, as written in its draft form, is 30 days. Um, it can be a shorter period of time. The 30 days does allow ample opportunity for staff to identify an incident and have the opportunity to review uh, the video when that incident took place. Okay, yeah, Councilor Grace. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I really um, appreciate your comments earlier about, the, about Section 7. Um, I wonder if we could ask Linda, um, why did you include the um, sections in there that weren't related to criminal activity? So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the unlawful activity um, is a provision. So in the event that basically it was written, if so, that it was a little bit broader than um, just the, if a a security incident, an act of crime was conducted. Um, so if the camera, if eventually we had a camera for the, the landfill site, for example, um, the crime would be um, the dumping of rubbish, that type of thing. So some of those provision in there um, would enhance the safety and the security of the employees. The video can be watched for that particular reason. So. It, it was expanded just to allow more kind of the flexibility of when it can be used. Um, but there is no, there was no intent to have it for any other reason. The investigating an insurable claim against the municipality. Um, again, that, that's part of a kind of a stretch of law enforcement or, or the investigative part of it. So um, the mayor has brought up that another person or a member of the public could use it for an insurable claim against the municipality. I suppose so, but it has to fall in within the freedom of information and why it would be released. So there is kind of the checks and balance that's in the freedom of information um, that would protect that information. Um, it is broader than what the um, kind of the scope of the policy is. So I will take my direction from council on this particular one. Um, I think when you are initiating this, a couple of council members have indicated that this is a pilot. Uh, the pilot itself can be reevaluated. The policy um, in the last uh, paragraph, it's to be reviewed every two years. So uh, if you wanted to start out with a kind of scaled down approach to when the policy or how the policy can be re reviewed, um, we can consider that part of the, pol the pilot and within two years, we can bring you back with something that um, meets the needs of the municipality if, if indeed it did need to be expanded. But as I say, I'll take my direction from council on, on uh, section seven. Yeah, I think I should, and I wouldn't want to uh, impugn your intent, Linda, I know your intent is, is good. Uh, it's the, sometimes though, um, the intent of the person drafting the document can be lost over time uh, when, people change and times change, right? So I think we wanna be very careful with this. Um, my preference would be a, a, a narrowed down version of the document to, going forward, but uh, of course that's only me uh, speaking. I, Councilor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, if we're talking about possible changes to the policy as the document as it's presented, there's another area that isn't necessarily addressed in my mind adequately and that is um and i thought of it when the when the clerk brought up the idea of uh the, the dump and maybe we had a camera over at the at the um the area where you dump your brush and uh, composting and so there, there's two different types of video surveillance there's the passive video surveillance like many of us have on our houses perhaps the residential type where there's a camera and it's got some recording device that 24 hours a day records information on a loop. And if you need to, you can go back and view that information and say, oh yeah, at this point in time, something happened. 
And then there's the act of surveillance where somebody at the dump may be sitting in the dump office watching a monitor with a camera at the land at the um, composting site and being continuously monitoring that situation. And although the, the policy talks about webcams, which, uh, which I think we're all familiar with, we're on a webcam right now, um, it, there, there's a difference between that and say, say there was, they knew there was violence going, there was a party going to happen on a certain night, say it's Canada Day, and the town decided that it's Canada Day. Every time we have Canada Day, there's some hooligans show up at the beach and drink and throw beer cans all over the beach. So we're going to set up a camera down there and we're going to have the cops sit at the station or sit or, or have town employees sit somewhere and, and monitor that thing all night long so that when they show up, we'll be able to pounce on them. That's that's the act of monitoring. And that that's a different kettle of fish altogether. And I think the policy should address the differences between those two and that this policy I think is what we're talking about is the passive type where we put up a camera kind of like the the trail cameras that I put in the bush to see when the deer are walking by my tree stand it's a passive surveillance motion activated kind of thing it's not uh, it's not me sitting on a monitor watching it uh, 24 hours a day and that if we're going to if we're going to put any revisions into the policy I would like to see some clear differentiation between those two types of video, video surveillance monitoring. Thank you. Okay, so uh, um, we'll get uh, Councilor Schreider and Councilor Grace hoping to bring the debate to a uh, conclusion. So let's uh, get our points out quick and work our way to a decision here. Councilor Schreider. Uh, fair enough, and, and, and through you. Um, Linda, just to clarify though, is that through this policy, the under the clerk, the responsibility is only with the clerk's depart department to inch to review and to ensure that the request to review information is appropriate and that there's a log maintained. Is that is that accurate or no? Through you, Mr. Ed, that is accurate. So it, it's not a free for all, or it's not a live viewing, and there's a difference between. Um, requesting so if if it was the department or the director of public works that had an incident and there was video surveillance equipment available at that facility they could put that request through to the clerk the clerk determines if that's appropriate or not and that you would view it and that you would continue that log or keep that log maintain that log and get that record that is correct thank you Councilor grace well thank you mr mayor i i I would support um, asking uh, the clerk to to go back and and narrow the language. Uh, I liked Councillor Mayette's suggestion of including um, a definition of and, and differentiation between active and passive um, surveillance. Um, I mean, I I I, th I think your comments, Mr. Mayor, were convincing to me that this language is too broad. And uh, so, however we want to give that direction, that's something I, I think would be useful. Thank you. Linda, if, um, if council were to do that, would a motion to defer suffice? Um, you can defer it if you want to see it before it comes back to the council table, that's an option. If you want to see it at the council table at the next meeting, it would be accompanied with an information report explaining the changes to the policy. Okay, so you so what you're suggesting, Linda, is we could council could approve it uh, tonight, come uh, with on the caveat that it would come back amended. That is correct. So we would uh, so we, we would uh, it would be we could do a motion we could amend the motion slightly um, to uh, pardon me let me just find it here uh, we could amend the motion slightly uh, the council approved the video surveillance policy and direct staff to return to council with an amended version. Yes. Okay. So um, do you want to make that motion, Council Grace? Yes, I, I think Councillor Matt also had something. I don't know if it's before we go with that or. Let's just, I, okay. Councillor Matt, do you have a comment? Sorry, uh, Mr. I was going to make a motion oh, sure. okay. that, that we defer the policy and, and that they come back amended that we can 
then approve an amended policy. Because unless there's some urgency, which I'm not seeing here, mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's this, we need to get this right. And to approve it on some future promise that it's going to be amended, uh, I'm not as comfortable with as I am uh, just deferring it and bring it back when it's been amended and let us have a look at it. That'd be my motion. Okay, so that's a motion to defer, moved by Councillor Mayet, second by Councillor Grace. Uh, I then we'll ask all in favor of the motion to defer. It's one, two, three, four, and opposed. One, two, three, four. How did I, oh yeah, there's four and four, so the motion's defeated. Uh, so we'll consider the main motion. Uh, so the motion is uh, that council approve the video surveillance policy. And so uh, I'll ask all in favor. Two, three, four, and opposed. Two, three, four, that's defeated. Uh, so um, Linda will go back, I suspect, and take another crack at the policy and see if she can come forward with something that council can get to pass committee of the whole. Is that, uh, is that okay, Linda? So my interpretation of maybe, yeah, maybe what would be- hard. Maybe I can't give you that direction. Um, is that you're still looking for that section seven to be amended. Um, that would certainly change where my hand went in the vote that just took place. I think if we could have a, we'll come back with a new crack at the, at the resolution, maybe we can find a way to pass it. I don't think, I do not believe council's intent is to finally and completely defeat this policy. So let's try, to, let's try to come back with an amended version uh, that will carry. Okay, and we're coming back to committee of whole? Yes. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on then to 7.7, .7, communications petitions for committee of the whole information. And there's five items there for information. Either questions or comments uh, on any of those? So, oh, Councilor Schreider. Uh, sorry, and through you, I just want to pull out um, number four. Um, there was a word left out in, um, sorry, let me get there, 8.4 um, A. It should read that the existing mandate of the Lamont Sports Park Fundraising Strategy Committee be amended. So I, I apologize about that. That's on me. Okay, are those, uh, yeah, all right, thank you. Are there um, any other, anything else on any of those? Uh, yeah, Councilor Mayer. Did you save my head? Yes, I did, Councilor Mayer. Um, just, um, I'm reading the minutes of the striking committee. And uh, is, that, is that where we are? Yep, yep. yep. Um, so you're, uh, you're developing four new committees, uh, the, the bike environmental committee, bike committee, youth committee, Youth Engagement Committee and the Attainable Housing Committee. Is that what I'm reading correctly or is this? Uh, so the committee is, but so what we did, as you recall, we did um, when we put out the questionnaire to members of council for your committee preferences, we asked uh, what committees you'd also like to see form uh, down the road or, and so um, we're working on, these are the ones we heard back from members of council uh, we're not going to be able to strike them all at once. As you'll recall, the striking committee's approach has been to only ask each major department to support one committee at a time. Uh, so these will be, uh, these are what's out there. I think there's interest on the striking committee to strike these committees, uh, It's but they won't be struck. You'll see the environmental one is on tonight for your consideration, uh, but uh, they won't all roll at once. And, and we don't have terms of reference for, the only one we have terms of reference for are, is the Environmental Stewardship Committee. The rest are still in process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Don't see any. So that moves on to item eight, my report. And I will just update you on um, my, the first uh, report in there uh, on the report on delegation of lot creation responsibilities to local councils. This is something that I've been working on for uh, a couple of years now and you'll see I say in there that the report recommended that the County Council uh, direct staff to uh, canvas local municipalities to determine their interest in accepting lot creation responsibilities. I can report to you that County Council has given that direction uh, to its staff. Uh, so uh, County staff will be coming out to the lower tiers to um, discuss whether or not um, 
we and our, our counterpart municipalities would like to take on these lot creation responsibilities um, uh, and to discuss a process by which to make that change. Uh, so I wanted to update you to let you know that. I would also say, uh, as I said a few a little while ago with regard to the good growth report, but also the communities report, uh, those um, are really dense and interesting documents. The good growth interim report is quite a report, really interesting stuff, particularly for our municipality. So uh, um, I'd really encourage you to read those and uh, to provide, and we'll have opportunity to comment on them. These are, there's public processes on connected to both of them. I suspect given what was going on and maybe Kara will know, I suspect uh, Jay's intent, your intent, staff's intent is to, is to bring these forward to us to maybe to look at it, the planning committee uh, and to offer any comments from the town. Uh, so uh, have a good read of those and, uh, and form your thoughts on them. Anyway, that's my report. And that moves us then on to nine report of the department heads. And the first one is just an information report on the 2020 council remuneration. Any questions on it? I don't see any. And so that then moves on to item two, an information report on staff leadership training program. The CAO, you have any comments you wanna to make to this one? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, and thank you. Uh, this is just a brief report and information report for Council to provide you a bit of an update uh, through the 2021 budget deliberations. Uh, there was a request to support some funding for staff leadership training. Uh, I wanted to highlight for you that a number of different uh, options were investigated for staff uh, for this option and that we'll be advancing with a program by Tony Villadal Consulting. Uh, the thoughts behind this is to develop uh, the opportunities for multiple cohorts within the year. So I'm looking at probably two cohorts. So it'll be a multi-year program that's uh, available to staff. Uh, there'll be two focuses uh, that are outlined in the report, one on talent development. So any team member or employee interested in developing their skills and an emerging leaders program that looks at team members that are developing skills around supervisor or management roles. Also included there a list of some potential courses that could make up uh, this opportunity. Again, this will be advanced uh, after I've had a specific conversation with Ms. Villadelli to move it forward. But as I mentioned, uh, looking at doing probably two cohorts a year, one in talent development, one in emerging leaders. Uh, 2021 will be a launch of this in quarter three, uh, looking for a talent development cohort to move forward. Uh, over the next couple of months, we'll be moving forward uh, the operations of how that'll work with the senior management team so that we can get the successful uh, participants engaged in the program and then looking to recognize staff uh, by both council and the administration as they complete that program. So just a bit of an update on that and how that's moving forward for council and I'm happy to take any questions. Sure, are there any questions for the CAO or comments? Uh, Councilor Schreiber. Um, not a, sorry, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, not as much a question, but I think that uh, just even looking at those outlines, Kara, I, I think it's excellent. Tal talent development and emerging leaders. So what this shows to the staff is that um, we're investing in you. You're here with us. It, it's great to retain, um, or sorry, it's great to attract uh, qualified staff and, and, and develop them and develop their skills and invest in them. But I think to retain them, to keep them, um, to keep them engaged um, and, and to develop their skills, I think is is fantastic. So um, very good on on you and the senior senior leadership team in order to to set this up. I think it's a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Further comments, questions? I don't see any. Yes, thanks very much uh, for this, uh, Kara. This is a really good report and uh, exciting to see. Looking forward to seeing the fruits of all this work uh, down the road. Okay, so that brings us to the end of Committee of the Whole. So we'll do announcements by members and the Deputy Mayor. Nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Okay, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. March the 11th, I attended, uh, participated, I think a few members of the Council sat in on the Solid Waste Management Service Review by Dillon Consulting. And I just wanted to, you know, tip of the hat to, uh, you know, to, to Jessica Linthorne and particularly Dave Shorey, who, you know, facilitated that discussion. And I thought Dylan did a, a pretty darn good job. And if you haven't read the report, I'm sure everyone has. It's, it's a really interesting report to read, uh, taking a look at uh, the potential around solid waste management. And, and Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to you. Uh, you know, uh, I was contacted by one of the committee chairs uh, for one of our, our local uh, committees. And indicated that you as the mayor are uh, reaching out to committee chairs 
you know, just to, to check in to see how everything is going. Uh, is it time for maybe to take a look at making, making a presentation to council on some of the highlights of your committee, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to commend you for that. I think that's that's a really good thing you're doing is reaching out to the committee chairs. So um, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, that's a good do appreciate it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, thanks, Juan. Then how about Councillor uh, Smith? Thank you. Uh, and along the same theme, I would like to highlight uh, as we approach the first day of spring this weekend, we were about one day delayed, but we were able to remove the uh, winter decor from Coulter Parquet, thanks in large part to the volunteers of the BIA and to the Parks and Rec staff. Uh, who helped remove and, and store those um, those investments for another year. Um, and Mr. Mayor, I would also like to say, I know today's meeting was not um, uh, the final of our mayor's task force on economic recovery, but it, it is the final that we have scheduled. And I think it was said today that uh, we met 16 times. Is that accurate? Over the course of the last year, uh, made some great suggestions of which staff uh, was able to implement some, some great uh, supports to our local business community. And I just wanted to thank you for your leadership. And, and uh, I know this was a discussion months ago now uh, that um, we had internally and there was a, a level of trust that was given to our staff to come through with this this committee and uh, and they knocked it out of the park. Um, Heather Hyde and, and Jessica Linthorne were instrumental in bringing that group together along with your leadership, Mayor, and, uh, and I wanna thank you for your dedication to that cause. Yeah, absolutely. Staff did excellent work there for sure. Councillor Schreider. Um, nothing officially to report. I think just um, that it, it's so great of the nice weather that we're having and walking around all three of our communities um, over the past week, weekend, uh, and that as well as, you know, uh, public work staff and, and parks and rec staff and our volunteer committees like the rail trail and, and other groups like that are, are, you know, maintaining our trails and getting our parks ready to open. We're still only at March 22nd or March 23rd today and, and uh, the the public, I think, is being pretty patient with regards to uh, all of us not having our, our spring elements out yet. But um, I think it's great to see all the activity and for everybody to continue to be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I wanted to um, just make a couple of comments. One is to recognize um, our Rotary Clubs, uh, the Southampton Rotary, um, for their ongoing culinary wars, home cooking, uh, fundraising program um, and the St. Patrick's Day fundraiser. I don't know if any of you were able to join that, but it was fantastic. Uh, lots of wonderful local entertainment, um, support for our local restaurants, and it raised uh, about $5,000 to replenish the Saugeen Shores Police Fund uh, to provide emergency support for people in need. Uh, and I, I understand that the Port Elgin uh, Rotary Club is working on similar projects. And um, I, I, I just, you know, this is the work of, of these clubs um, throughout the pandemic to provide innovative ways of supporting the community, um, very much appreciated. Um, and uh, just uh, something uh, a little less official, but um, over the last month or so, I've had the pleasure of participating in several birthday drive-by celebrations. Um, and I know this has been happening all over the community throughout the pandemic. Uh, I wanna thank the residents who are doing this on their own to organize the events. It, it brings a lot of joy into the lives of everyone involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about Councillor Carr? Nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Okay, Councillor Mayat. Uh, I guess there's a couple things. I, I attended a uh, Ontario Association of Police Service Board meeting uh, virtually, and uh, and there was uh, uh, introduction of a brand new department, which is the Integrity Commissioner of Policing for Ontario. So if anybody's interested in uh, the uh, activities that are going on in response to this uh, wave of uh, change in the way that we do policing, uh, there's a website you can look at with the Integrity Commissioner. Uh, of policing and uh, and the other thing I intended was a virtual meeting of the clean energy frontier which is a um, through the NII and uh, and it was uh, it was on last Friday and it was a very informative uh, discussion took place uh, lots of participation from the members talking about um, 
energy storage, some of the initiatives that are going on, uh, new and exciting initiatives that are being spearheaded by uh, Bruce Power and the, and the Clean Energy Frontier group. Uh, there's some really great stuff coming out. Uh, some of it uh, we've been asked to um, somewhat keep uh, under our hats until Bruce Power gets a chance to announce it. But suffice to say, there's some exciting things coming out with the, in the area of carbon credits and uh, and uh, you know greenifying and uh, making uh, making our area a uh, energy center and a, a green energy center. So it's uh, really exciting stuff, and I think it'll dovetail well with the environmental committee that uh, we just spoke about a few moments ago. So thank you. Thank you. And using the power of ESP, I've gathered that the vice deputy mayor has another comment. Vice deputy mayor. It's very, I, so I, I meant to mention this earlier. I, I was speaking with a, uh, maybe you could provide a little update here, but I was speaking to a young lady today of 76 years of age, and she was uh, just ecstatic that she'd received a phone call about uh, receiving her COVID-19 uh, vaccine, 76 years old. And, and so I, I wasn't, uh, I was just wondering, you know, for the community out there, if you can share any new information, I mean, there's a phone call that was received for the 76 to 80. Uh, we, we, I think the 80 and over is just about complete, I believe in Bruce County, I, I'm not 100% certain, but I do receive a fair number of inquiries from people saying, what do you know, what do you know, what do you know about vaccines? And, but I just wanna give you one example of a person was called just this morning about, uh, about her vaccine. So yeah. can, you, can you share any inf new information for the public? Um, well, it's good to, good to hear that that individual is going to get their vaccine, and uh, I'm receiving some phone calls as well from folks uh, who are waiting for vaccines and eager to get their vaccines. And I guess, um, you know, it's difficult uh, in that, um, you know, the supply is still quite limited, particularly coming into our region. I think uh, Dr. Era has, has made that clear. Um, but... Uh, um, and so I guess what I would say to the public, if I had anything to say to the public, is to uh, try to be patient. Uh, I know that um, nobody is more eager to vaccinate people than public health. And, they, and I can tell you that Dr. Era is advocating strongly on the behalf of our region to get vaccines into our region so that they can be delivered uh, here. We have, we have just an unbelievable amount of capacity in Grey Bruce to deliver vaccines like like considerably more than we're using at the moment. So all we need is the supply to come and we'll be able to deliver it uh, and uh, hopefully deliver much of it in soggy and chores. But of course, we're just, um, we're playing that waiting game uh, a bit and, at, and a bit at the mercy of, um, you know, that supply and, and where it's going. So um, I don't have a lot more to share on what's coming up soon, but, uh, you know, hopefully the supply will pick up and we'll get more people vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's fine, Mr. Mary. I just want to share that story. I thought it was a positive development, and uh, maybe it's a sign that uh, 76 days is just around the corner. So thanks for that. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you for that. Okay, so I have a couple of things. Um, one, I wanted to just uh, say I cut the ribbon at Domino's Pizza uh, a few weeks ago, uh, which was great to see a new business open in our community uh, and is a and, uh, very successful business, very successful entrepreneur, and we wish him all the best. Uh, today is World Water Day, uh, and we have a lot of water in our community, and uh, it's receding a little bit at the moment, which is good, but uh, we're um, uh, obviously eager as a community to protect our water resources. Uh, we're gonna strike this environmental committee, I hope uh, uh, later tonight and, uh, and you know, do everything we can to protect uh, our water and our community on this World Water Day. And finally, I wanted to just make a, um, a read you a list of names. The long service uh, awards uh, at the Town of Sogging Shores were, uh, um, handed out. Um, we would normally do that at our Christmas party. Unfortunately, the Christmas party didn't happen for obvious reasons. And so, um, but we have had uh, several employees of the Town of Socking Shores who have reached milestones with us. And I wanted to read their names to you uh, so that, uh, so we could recognize them. Uh, so first we have Ken Cook, obviously a police officer who has been with us for 10 years. Uh, Jack Fraser with Public Works, who's celebrating 25 years with the town. Steve West uh, of Public Works, 15 years. Uh, Gary Baker, uh, Public Works, celebrating 20 years. Richard Dahl, Public Works, uh, 15 years. Chris Williamson, Public Works, 10 years. Lori Pearson, Community Services, 15 years. Uh, Randy Martin, Community Services, 10 years. And Steve McLean with Public Works, 15 years. So I wanted to congratulate all of those folks from across our organization on their long service, thank them for their service, and uh, 
and look forward to uh, many more years of uh, working with them uh, at the Downs Lodging in Shores. So with that, uh, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councilor Carr on favor. The committee stands adjourned. We'll reconvene at uh, oh, 8.25. Mr. Mayor, we've reached 8.25. We have all council members present with the exception of Councilor Rich who is absent this evening. You may begin. Great, thank you, Linda. Uh, we'll call to order this regular council meeting. Second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. To ask any member if you have one of those you'd like to declare at this time. Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments. We have no public meeting. So that moves us on to adoption of the minutes. Uh, and I have a resolution that the minutes of the council meeting of March 8, 2021 be adopted and note and file the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of March 8, 2021 as presented. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Schreider. Questions or comments to either of those sets of minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. That moves us then on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And the first one is a general government report regarding information technology strategic plan. And I have a resolution that the information technology strategic plan 2021 to 2025 be approved. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Mayette, seconded by Smith. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. That moves us then on to the second report, which is an infrastructure and development report regarding the transfer of two archaeological lands. And I have a resolution that two archaeological sites be transferred to the town within the Summerside subdivision. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor, seconded by Matheson. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. That then moves us on to seven report of municipal officers and committees. And the first one is a staff report on Saugeen River Bridge SS-13 Peer Repair Award. And I have a resolution that Alexman Contracting Incorporated be awarded the contract for the Saugeen River Bridge SS-13 Peer Repair Project in the amount of $150,125 plus applicable HST, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the necessary documents. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Carr. Seconder? Mayette. Questions or comments? Uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor, and then we'll get Councilor Grace. To you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Amanda. Amanda, uh, thank you for your report, and uh, it's nice to see that bridge being addressed. and. Uh, I'm just looking at the uh, the bridge reserves, $119,000 approximately coming from bridge reserves. Could you just bring us up to date, Amanda? I just might put you on the spot. I think I asked this question earlier today, but in terms of the amount of monies we're putting into our bridge reserves on a on an annual basis and how our bridge reserve account is doing. I see Daniel's on the call here too. Thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. We put in 100,000 every year into the bridge reserves, but we are spending more than we are putting in on our bridges combined from that contribution as well as taxation. This year, uh, our department and finance are working together on a reserve strategy. And part of that is going to be up with how much we need to put in, what the balance needs to be to um, prepare us for emergency repairs in the future. My question was really around how we're doing with, are we high enough with our level of contribution? So thanks for that. And I had Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, Amanda, just a question um, on the um, uh, section of the report that talks about reallocating um, $61,400 from the concession to culvert repairs. What impact will that have upon the um, the status of the repairs in that culvert. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. We had our consultants go back and look at all of our projects that are underway right now because of the cost increases that we're seeing. And for concession to, um, they're looking at a change to the design as well that would include wing walls. So we believe that concession two will be postponed to 2022. And so the impact is really a deferral of that all that money for that culvert spent. What doesn't get spent this year will go into the bridge reserve and we'll come back to council for future funds for next year. Okay, any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That, that's carried. All right, that moves us on. Sorry, I flashed away. 
That moves on to the second report, which is a staff report on Brooker Street Reconstruction Award. And I have a resolution that Doug Welsh Construction Limited be awarded the contract for the Brooker Street Reconstruction Project in the amount of $126,208.49 plus applicable HST, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the necessary tender documents. Is there a mover and seconder for the resolution? Moved by Smith, seconded by Carr. Are there questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just for clarity, this is sanitary sewer replacement on the Bricker Street uh, main, uh, up the middle of Bricker Street from essentially uh, Walmart North. Is that correct? And we're not, and then the second part of the question is we're not changing the, uh, the uh, potable water supply line. Because have, have we not experienced several? Uh, failures of the water line in that same corridor. And I wonder if uh, if there's any efficiency to be gained in doing the water and the sewer at the same time. Through okay. you, Mr. Mayor, this section is from Green to Mill Street, but uh, in answer oh. to your other question, there would be efficiencies if we were looking at the same section of road, but it is a sanitary driven project, um, but again, from Green to Mill. Oh, Green to Mill, I see that now. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Carry on. Yep. Are there further questions to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. All right. And that moves on to the third report, which is a uh, staff report on a traffic on traffic counter signs with display purchase. And I have a resolution that the purchase of three traffic counter signs with digital display be approved in the amount of $12,765 plus applicable HST from Stinson ITS. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Matheson. Questions or comments? See, oh, Councilor Mayette. I hope that uh, we have these new signs we put on some sort of uh, crime prevention, perhaps even video surveillance, because in the past we've lost them where they've been uh, mysteriously hooked up and taken away in the middle of the night. So let's hope these ones last a little longer. Okay, further questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. All right, then that moves us on to a staff report on the Lamont Sports Park Construction Award. I'm sure the uh, director will wanna to speak to this one. We will put the resolution on the floor first though. I have a resolution that Anthony Furlano Construction Incorporated be approved as the preferred contractor for the Lamont Sports Park construction contract in the amount of $5,319,233.85 plus applicable HST through debt financing and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the necessary documents and further that council approve $55,000 for Sandpoint well installation and to supply and install shelter enclosures for facility port olets to be financed through debt financing. Is there a mover and second? Moved by Schreider, seconded by Masson. Uh, we'll turn it over to the director to speak to the recommendation resolution. Thank you, and through you, yes, this evening, uh, council seeking approval to award the contract for Lamont Sport Park um, for the construction of phase one. And I remind council that that is for the first pin wheel and the infrastructure. All general contractors that bid on this project were pre-qualified and all were, consider, were considered equally capable of completing this project. However, not only was Anthony Falero Construction the lowest bid, the company is extremely familiar with the project site, having visited on more than one occasion and were comfortable with the site conditions. Additionally, their item costs were well below other competitors, reflecting a concerted effort to win the bid. And as well, they have chosen to work with local subcontractors located in Collingwood and Walkerton to enhance their team. Once approved, the general contractor is prepared to commence work by the end of this March and conclude in December of 2021. Council's reminded that the diamonds will sit for the 2022 season until sufficient seed propagation has occurred and the public can expect to start using the diamonds in spring 2023 if approved. Although the tender is $344,183,000 over a council approved budget, <clears throat> the work completed in phase one will certainly provide infrastructure for future development within this footprint. And staff will communicate key milestones with the public and with council so that everyone is informed on the progress. 
uh, council may wish to consider naming right opportunity um, for businesses or service groups for the four diamonds that could potentially provide additional revenue of up to $200,000 to offset the added cost for construction. And finally, the report identifies that financial impact be considered through debt financing. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from members? Council Schreider. Uh, thank you. And through you, Jane, this is great news. Um, I, I'm so happy to be able to move this recommendation. I think it's an exciting time for uh, for everybody involved that has been looking forward to this project. So uh, great job to you and your team who's been working with the consultant thus far. Um, just with regards to the, um, and you and I did chat about it, but I think it would be good for everybody to hear, um, just with regards to the total bid prices of the five submissions that you've received, there's a, a discrepancy of, of about 4 million, um, quick math in my head, um, with our awarded vendor being the lowest one by, by you know, 2.6 million um, up until the second place, second lowest bidder, I should say. Um, could you just maybe go over what some of those discrepancies would be with regards to such a span in receiving five bids for the same project and that you guys are confident that your suggested vendor um, has all of the specifications included um, with the scope of work that, you've, um, that you put out to bid? Yeah, thank you for your question. And um, a few things there I'll answer for sure. Um, working very closely with the prime consultant through this project and the benefits of having a prime consultant with the scope of this project is um, certainly appreciated. Prime consultant has worked with all of these contractors, I can tell you. And um, certainly, uh, as I indicated uh, in, my, in my notes, is that all of them are equally capable of, of completing this project. They were pre-qualified and um, have, have worked many times with this prime consultant. So some of the, um, some of the items that I did indicate was that, um, that they're certainly capable of doing it. The construction line are in cost with, and well below some of their competitors. They have not, um, the reflection of looking at those costs and uh, really critiquing all of the submissions. Uh, there are no surprises. This particular contractor um, visited the site more than many of the others, I can tell you that right now, and is completely familiar with the location that we're looking at. And uh, um, many of the costs are in line, whether it's electrical, is un under, earthworks is under because they, they recognize the fact that we had a tremendous amount of earthworks av available on site to begin with. Um, no surprises, concrete and um, metal are high, but it's, a, it's high across our area and it's indicative to where we're, we are right now. So like many projects that come in, we see a wide array of, of costing. Um, and this is no, no different when you're looking up into the five to, to $8 million price span. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have another? Yep, yeah, Councilor Schreider. Uh, sorry, just one follow up question, and thank you for for all of that information, uh, Jane. Great news. Would there be with the report that we had from Jess and Amanda earlier on with regards to the business park and and some of that development? We're probably we being Lamont Sports Park. We're probably ahead of 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 the construction <laughs> for up there to create any efficiencies with regards to water, electrical, anything like that? Is there any efficiencies that we could gain by, by doing the two in tandem? Or if not, then that's fine too. No, we, thank you for your question. And we certainly have considered that where applicable, where we can. Uh, the two projects are uniquely different in scope and scale. Um, any areas where there could be efficiencies were considered. At this point, uh, we're not really seeing any at the, um, as we're moving forward. And we are a little bit more advanced as we started um, earlier. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll get the Vice Deputy Mayor and then come to Council Grace. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A few things. Uh, Jane, I just wanted to commend you on the, uh, the four $50,000 uh, sponsorship opportunities, naming rights, you know, for the four diamonds on the first pinwheel. I think that, you know, if there's people out there listening this evening, uh, the media are, are, you know, are tuned into this meeting tonight, uh, let's start promoting that now in that, you know, I'm a memory of a loved one, a, a corporation, a business, um, you know, former uh, slow pitch fastball players, uh, families. You know, I, I just think it's endless, uh, the opportunities to approach people about the, uh, you know, $50,000 sponsorship opportunities, first come, first serve. And uh, let's get the word out there because I, th I, I really do believe they are out there. And so I just want to commend you for, for making that suggestion. And I hope that staff... Uh, 
you know, with a matter of a dozen letters and some follow-up phone calls could easily accomplish, not easily accomplish that, but, but uh, could carry that out. So, so thanks for that. The, um, I'm just wondering, Jane, with the, uh, you know, phase, phase three of this, well, phase two is the washroom facility next year. And then, you know, phase three to finish it up with the next, uh, you know, with the next four pod, um, you know, whatever that may look like, we don't, we're not quite sure yet, but Jane, I, the, for the next four, uh, whatever they are, uh, uh, for the next pod, um, diamonds in, in 2023, um, 2024, will all of the infrastructure for irrigation, hydro, water, uh, will all that be done underground so that the, the, those, those, those services are ready to go for phase three in 2023, 2024, 2025, whenever that may be. Um, is that, will all that be underground, Jane? Is that why the cost in our capital forecast is, you know, so much lower than phase one? There are some advantageous opportunities here in phase one to um, expand some of our electrical, our road works um, in preparation for whatever phase two and three may look like for future development on that site. It makes sense to, to do that now, why the price is, is right, so to speak, as we're uncertain um, the future of that costing what that may be. Yeah, that's good to hear that that, that work is being done now. It makes, makes perfectly good sense. I see Daniel's on, on the call, and I know whether our CIO wants to stand this, answer this question, or maybe Daniel, but um, for the long-term uh, boring, from a long-term boring um, perspective, Daniel, I guess this is, you know, if there's an opportune time to borrow money for long-term financing, uh, would be now the rates are low. Maybe you can share with uh, members of council what boring rates are looking at, looking like right now, and is this something from a long-term boring perspective would be over 20, 25-year uh, debenture payment or what, what, what are we thinking here? So in terms of the rates themselves, they're still quite low, somewhere in the two to two and a half uh, percent range on uh, the 10, 15, 20 year type, type loans that we may be looking at. Uh, we haven't decided formally on a, on a number on an exact length of the loan. We're still um, honing as different requests come in, uh, in terms of different different projects that have come up over the past year. Um, we're, I think, retaking a look at some of the long-term financial plans and how much debt uh, needs to be taken on right now and how much uh, debt capacity needs to be saved for later. The project itself is appropriate for a long-term loan of, of around 20 years. Uh, we'll be coming back in the summer, likely around July or August, with a, an application for the loan itself, and, and we'll have more details and recommendations at that time. Thank you, Daniel. And just to follow up, Mr. Mayor, if I might, um, we're con continuing to contribute to the Legacy Fund, and um, this will in no way, shape, or form affect uh, the bottom line number uh, for the Legacy Fund. It's strictly long-term financing, correct? Aside, aside, outside of the uh, parameters of the legacy fund. So that's the current plan. It's it's approved by council for as as fully debt financed. Uh, the servicing of that debt, the ongoing payments on that debt, uh, it may be staff's recommendation that those come from either the legacy fund itself or from contributions to the legacy fund. Gotcha. Thanks for that, Daniel. Yeah, I think that's important to be clear at this point and for anybody watching and for the public. Uh, the Town of Sogging Shores has the operating budget capacity to carry this loan without raising taxes. Uh, we have the, we have the uh, at present enough room in our operating budgets to borrow this five and a half million dollars uh, and uh, without further affecting the tax levy. Are there uh, further questions or comments? Oh, sorry, Councilor Grace, I had you next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you. Um, Jane, thank you. This is exciting news. When I think back to just a year and a half ago when we were, uh, when the community was so united, um, participating in the Kraft Heinz competition and our success with that, it's, it's really great to see this. Um, I just have one question about the 2022 period. I wonder if you could speak to what security provisions you'll have um, while the, the fields are dormant um, during that period of time. 
So the diamonds will be, um, will have fencing around all of them with a, a locked mechanism. So only authorized personnel can get in onto those diamonds. And obviously that fencing will stay up permanently. Um, each, each diamond is fenced um, for perpetuity. So that's our control mechanism. And it's really important that, you know, council has, has uh, approved this amount that includes the fencing because upon our travels with some other ball diamonds who chose not to put up fencing like this, they have experienced damage on those fields. And so to have that fencing up is our security for around those diamonds. Okay. Further questions uh, to the uh, resolution? I don't uh, see any, I uh, just uh, for myself say that it's uh, really uh, pleased to see this project uh, advancing uh, at this point. A lot of people have been doing a lot of work for a long time to get us to this point on this uh, particular development. And uh, in, uh, what is it about, what are we looking at? 18 months or so, we'll be playing ball. So, uh, well, some people will be playing ball. I probably won't be, but uh, some people will be playing ball. I'll be watching. Uh, so it's uh, good news for our community. Okay, so you've heard the uh, recommendation uh, and you have the resolution, I suppose. Uh, so all in favor. It's carried. Okay, then that moves us on to uh, right, item five, striking committee report on the environmental stewardship ad hoc uh, committee. And there is a resolution that the terms of reference for an environmental stewardship ad hoc advisory committee be approved. Is there a mover and seconder? Uh, moved by Grace, seconded by Carr. Questions or comments? I don't see any, uh, so I'll just say that I'm pleased to see this uh, committee uh, reaching the point of uh, being struck. And I think it's an opportunity, it was the last time we had an environmental committee in the town of Sogging Shores uh, was I think in 2008, 2009, just a little over, maybe a little over a decade ago, about 12 years ago. Uh, so it really is time, I think, to have a look at this at our programs again, and to look at the current uh, a situation with um, you know the municipality and our stewardship of our environmental assets. So uh, looking forward to striking this committee and getting some good members and, uh, and getting uh, a report from them. So with that, you've heard the resolution, all in favor? That's carried. And that moves us then on to item six, which is uh, with, to do with the Lamont Sports Park Fundraising Strategy Committee report. And I have a resolution that council received the Lamont Sports Park Fundraising Committee report and accept option blank as recommended. So why don't we, I don't actually really have a resolution there. So why don't we discuss this and uh, and see where we end up before I read that one in. Uh, Councillor Schreider. Uh, thank you and through you, um, I just wanna thank, uh, so Councillor Jamie Smith, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor Mike Myatt, Connor Yurth, um, and Dushanbo McKay uh, John Willits, Jeff Myatt, and Rob Fawcett. Um, so I spoke to this committee at the March 9th meeting um, <clears throat> and asked, asked them not to take this experience of sitting on a volunteer committee as a negative or a deterrent for future opportunities um, that interest them. Uh, a fundraising strategy committee launching at the beginning of a pandemic was terrible timing and the success of our intent and progress never was able to commence. Um, Forward thinking and proper project planning discussions around with the committee uh, to forward two options for uh, council consideration and direction. Um, option number one or option A uh, is desired from the committee and the existing members with one vacancy um, has offered to remain on the committee if the mandate is revised. The capital forecast shows $2 million over the next three years for the Lamont Sports Park. We believe um, that th this committee, we believe that community engagement and user group consultation is required prior to the next phase of the Lamont Sports Park. User groups and community groups will have changed since phase one consultation, and we need to ensure that council and staff, that we put forward a project plan and construct elements at the Lamont Sports, Lamont Sports Park that is in the community's best interest. Um, <clears throat> the baseball community is thankful, supportive, and eager for the planning so far at the Lamont Sports Park. We want to make sure that we get it right uh, for future phases. The conceptual design showed room for a second pinwheel and or other amenities. We need to know what that pinwheel or other amen amenities need to be. Our community and our user groups will tell us that. 
staff put together a solid budget and a way for us to not lose momentum for the phase one of the park. So I thank staff and council for supporting this. Our committee feels that suitable next steps would be community and user group engagement to ensure phase two or phase three is well thought out and justified. Far too often, I think that we're criticized for not completing uh, public engagement. And here is one that we will do well. And here is one that we need to initiate. Um, I believe if we use our capital forecast as our roadmap for project planning as, as what we're supposed to, um, this is a suitable next step and one that should be supported by council. Um, I think that the timing of this consultation is key for this spring or this summer, this fall, uh, if we're going to follow our capital forecast that we, that we have. We have uh, $4 million, nope, sorry, $2 million showing in the next three years um, for Lamont Sports Park in our capital forecast. And uh, I think that this committee here is, is eager to, um, to stay on. Um, to look at uh, a revised mandate from our striking committee, um, if that's the wish of council, and to roll their sleeves up and, and hit the ground running. So thank you very much. Thank you. Further comments? Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, of course, support, support the committee recommendation. I want to thank Councillor uh, Schreider for doing an ex excellent job facilitating the meeting last uh, couple weeks ago. And I just want to, I want to thank uh, our, our Deputy Mayor Matheson as well for, you know, the, the great job they did with, you know, over, over I guess a year or two ago now, um, taking a look at what those two pinwheels uh, could, could look like. Um, the first pinwheel, of course, is rolling out this year. The second pinwheel, um, I, I think what this committee wants to do uh, is to continue to look at developing a fundraising strategy is which, which what this committee was supposed to do for phase one. But again, COVID got, got in the way and, and, and it didn't happen and that's okay. Uh, but I think there's an opportune, uh, opportunity here now you know, for phase three um, to take a look at you know, what that pinwheel revisit it perhaps, just take a beat on the pulse, uh, not, not, to, you know, not to condemn or look down upon the work that Don and his group did. I think they did a commendable job, but you know, I think COVID-19 has really changed things a little bit. Um, you know, we, I, I think they, we just needed to, before we move forward with, with phase three and in two or three or four or five years, whatever it may be, that we need to do some community engagement just to see if it's still the right pinwheel where they're talking about two more slow pitch fields. We're already putting in four for men's we still need another two slow pitch fields and two other ball diamonds, or do we just need two more fields? And could we use some beach volleyball courts? Uh, should there be a max track be moved out there? So I, I think this is just taking, checking in um, on, on that next pinwheel. Um, that might be three, four, five years out, but start the planning process now. You know, if you take a look, if you take a look at the Lamont Sports Park, uh, the starting date, from the time we opened in 2023 to when we first started, will be four years. It's a full four years to get that diamond open to play ball. If we start now, you know, for phase three, we're probably going to take three, four years, maybe five years. But I, I think the, the, what the committee uh, who's been meeting for the lot, they met twice. Um, COVID got in the way and they didn't really get to the point of developing, implementing a fundraising committee or fundraising strategy but they like to do that for phase three. And they like to take one more look at, at what the second pinwheel looks like. Um, if it, it may come out that the work that our, our, our deputy mayor did with two slow pitch fields and a major ball diamond and a 235 foot field for, for, for fastball, lady slow pitch is still the right thing to do. But we think that, you know, the committee felt that, you know, before you make that kind of, you know, develop a fundraising strategy around that next pinwheel, make sure we've got the next pinwheel right. We just want to take one more look at it. It's two or three, four meetings, community engagement, where you bring in uh, the beach volleyball people, bring in girls fastball, boys fastball, baseball, uh, men's fastball, ladies slow pitch, and, and have one more chat and uh, check in basically, just check a beat on the pulse sort of thing. So that's what this committee was really wanting to do is expand the mandate they want to they, they want to finish their job of, of completing a fundraising strategy, but they want to make make sure 
that they're creating a fundraising strategy for the right amenities in the second pinwheel. So one more look, and it might very well be, it might very well look the very same way. So I think the idea was rather than wait a year or two, uh, start the planning process in 2021, come with a report late this year and, uh, and say to council, we revisited, we did a community engagement process and uh, we're gonna tweak it a little bit. We're gonna make a recommendation to council that we, we should maybe tweak it somewhat. Here's what happened to ladies slow pitch numbers this summer. Here's what happened with men's slow pitch numbers. Here's what's going on with minor ball numbers because it's been a year or two and, and, and COVID has played a little havoc with, with some numbers across the organization. So that's all it is. I, I just think that it, it's a good thing to do. I think it should be sent back to the striking committee uh, to take a look at it. You know, I wanna make one other comment uh, this evening. Um, and and Ms. Mr. Mayor, you may be commenting on this yourself, uh, no doubt, but you know, we've got a, a, a pool on the horizon. Uh, you know, we've got the, the Y pool agreement that's coming over the next uh, couple, two, three months. And I'm a believer, a firm believer that we need to start that fundraising campaign for a new uh, indoor rec facility, that it really should take priority right now. And, and some of the ball groups that maybe are gonna have to wait another three, four years for phase three, maybe a little upset with that, but there's a whole lot of other people in this community that wanna see the pool project move forward. So I, I, I would support, you know, it may take another four years, three, four, five years for phase three, but I, I'm not, th I'm thinking that's not that bad of a thing with the amount of money we're investing at Lamont right now and, and the new $30 million ticket uh, about to be presented to us for, for a potential Y operation. And I think that fundraising committee net needs to get underway. So just to finish up, I, I think we should still commence the planning process um, for phase three. It, it doesn't cost any money and, and it just allows that committee to finish the job that they, were, they set out to do uh, with, with, with developing a fundraising strategy, maybe not for phase one, but take a look at what the strategy could look like for phase three. So I, I, I endorse uh, what, the, what the committee uh, wants to do. And I think that the striking committee, Mr. Mayor, I hope will have you know, good discussion with that. So, thank you. Okay, um, I think I saw Councilor Smith put her hand up. Councilor Smith. Thank you, and through you, uh, uh, this, uh, quite frankly, this conversation has me a little torn and, and I'm a little perplexed. I'm hearing a few um, uh, different conversations happening here. So what we have before us is a recommendation to essentially expand the mandate of what was originally proposed to be a Lamont Sports Park funding, sorry, fundraising strategy committee. And if you recall, I was actually appointed to be a part of that committee, uh, not in part because I had any um, expertise in the, you know, uh, area of baseball, but because of um, the thought process around helping with the fundraising. Um, and, and now we're talking about what I see and what I would call in the supply chain world scope creep. And we're talking about moving what was very fundamentally established as a fundraising strategy committee into what, in my opinion, we've already exhausted, which was the ad hoc committee on Lamont Sports Park. We had a, a great group of volunteers who spent copious amounts of time developing uh, well-laid plans for the future of Lamont Sports Park, which included things beyond what is now being referred to as phase one at the time. It was just, you know, what are the things you want to see at Lamont Sports Park, which talks about everything from trails to trees to picnic benches. Um, so I'm concerned we're getting into what I call paralysis by analysis. And, and with all respect, uh, Mr. Vice Deputy Mayor, what I heard you say is we could be three to four years away, but I also heard you say, you know, we're 18 months from the ad hoc committee, so we need to do a pulse check. And I'm concerned that doing the pulse check now would further require a subsequent pulse check in three to four years when we may be required to do this again. So I would really like to see us narrow the scope of this committee to be focused on fundraising, which Mr. Vice Deputy Mayor, you'll recall, you and I swapped seats on this committee because of your experience in the fundraising realm. Um, and, and I'm concerned that we're expanding this beyond the endeavors of the reasons in which the individuals who are sitting on this committee were selected to be there. Uh, I don't want to see us engage additional community stakeholders without first going back to that group of stakeholders that have spent 
lots and lots of time giving us their ideas, or at least looking at the resolutions that they put forward. Uh, and, and I don't see this as, as the time to open that um, discussion up. I think that we could have a meaningful strategy developed in terms of fundraising without the minute details of what may be included in that phase. We have some con conceptual ideas of, of what could be included and more importantly, what the cost may be. And I think we can work on a campaign to raise those funds in that manner. Um, and, and I'll leave it with this thought. Um, we have, as I think Cheryl, Councillor Grace alluded to earlier, uh, a community that really rose together on the Lamont Sports Park Kraft Heinz Project Play. Uh, as, as you alluded, Councillor Grace, that was, you know, some 18 months ago now uh, when, when my son was in Rookie. Uh, and what I'm hearing, the comments that have, have me the most concerned this evening is we're talking uh, half a decade before uh, some of these some of the additional lands may be developed, uh, which would put my son in the Bantam age group. So for myself and many of the individuals who have followed this development quite closely, uh, I don't want to get stuck in any discussions where, you know, we, we have a plan. Uh, and and as, as the saying goes in nuclear, um, make the plan and work the plan. Uh, we have a recreational master plan that tells us the number of diamonds in which we anticipate needing. I'm concerned about the nuance of, of this COVID year and using the statistics of number of teams that may uh, ebb and flow right now versus the, the data that has been provided to us in advance. Uh, I, I don't think we need to knee jerk reactions to these uh, ebbs and flows in registration numbers. Uh, so I know I've thrown a lot of concerns out there, but ultimately, uh, I'd just like to summarize it by saying I don't think the mandate that these individuals who have been appointed to this committee were given the context that they were to create the, the plan around phase three. They were given the mandate to create a strategy for fundraising. And if they need advice on what that plan is, my suggestion would be that we go back to the original ad hoc committee who are well versed in this and ask them to put forward their next set of ideas. And I'd be curious uh, what the deputy mayor and chair of that committee might have to say on this. Okay, further comments? The deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't want to draw this up, but I just want to say to Councillor Schreider, Vice Deputy Mayor Myatt, and Councillor Smith, thank you for the work you did on this. It has been a, an incredible job trying to do fundraising during COVID. It, it really is. Um, and I agree with both points, but I agree a little more with Councillor uh, Smith right here. I do believe I, would, I really want to see this fundraising committee be extended to do exactly what they said. I want to see um, at the original committee, we talked about what are the, some of the extras that we'd like to see at, at the park in the first four, in the first four Cloverleaf. Things like portable fences so that we could uh, have the, the kids playing on, on fields where they could actually hit a home runner and the regulation size. You know, we won the $250,000 with Kraft Heinz. Let's make sure that we have the best accessible playground uh, for the kids that are out there, water park, all that, well, not water park, but fountains and, and all that stuff, plus the trail system that's going to be coming in there, knowing the number of people that ride their bikes to, to baseball in Soggy Shores right now. If we widen the rail trail, work with our, our rail trail partners, put lights on that, everybody, I, I'm guaranteeing 90% of the people at all times will be riding their bikes out to Lamont's Park. And we make it the, the enviable field uh, in Gray and Bruce County. So I like to see the. I really would like to see the fundraising committee move forward. Send it to the striking committee. We'll we'll hammer out the final details, bring it back to council, and and have it passed and move forward. So maybe I'll make a comment uh, following that. You know, I just want to. I I would like to. I would say thank you to the members of the committee, um, and uh, you know, and I I get the frustration uh, of you know being struck to, to do this committee to raise money to do a thing and not getting the chance to do that. I mean, that's why we. Put the committee together and they never got that chance and it was through no fault of their own it was just the way the world turned out and um we've had a real success fundraising no fundraising we're building phase one of this thing which is outstanding i uh, didn't need the fundraising we would have been nice to have some fundraising but they ultimately got it done without the fundraising um and you know i don't want to uh i don't want to have an outcome here where we um you know uh do something here at council where where we um you know don't honor those those members of that committee uh, you know, I'd like to make sure that um, 
you know, we try to come up with a thoughtful way to engage those folks. I want them to continue to be interested volunteers in our committees in the future and, and feel like they're getting something of value out of our committees. And I think we could probably still get something of value out of them, which is, you know, we, we don't just strike committees to be nice to people. We strike them because we need something from them. And I think uh, um, there's still maybe some things that we could get. So what I would suggest to council, if you're amenable to this, is um, without voting on either of these options tonight, why don't you refer uh, this, this resolution from the committee to the striking committee? Uh, give us the chance to um, look at these options. We have some other things we should we need to consider as a committee, the staging of our committees, the Department of Community Services. There's some other committees that are out there that uh, maybe we want to strike. We need to time them. Um, we need to come up with a mandate, et cetera, et cetera. So refer the whole thing to us. Uh, give uh, the three of us the chance to come up with a, uh, something to take to go forward here and bring back to you that uh, gives uh, gets what we want out of this committee, some concepts on fundraising and um, and tries to take into account some of the things we've heard here from council tonight. Is that, uh, is that something we can do, uh, Councillor Smith? Thank you. I, I do have two points, the first of which is that, you know what, I'll just stick to one. I have one point. Uh, if we could uh, have some timeline or parameters around that. Uh, I don't want to see either these uh, groups, this group get disengaged or us to lose what traction we do have going in the momentum. Um, is this something we could see continued in the timeline that Councilor Schreider has suggested in her motion? The striking committee is gonna to have to meet very soon to discuss appointing members to the new environmental ad hoc uh, committee. Uh, so that I can commit to you that the striking committee will meet uh, very soon. Um, we'll have this on our agenda. We'll come up with something and we'll come back to council. Um, you know, I, I don't, I guess I, I better not speak out of turn to give you, we won't, we won't leave it very long. We'll try to return to council as quickly as we can. And it, you know, Councilor Schreiber. Uh, thank you. And through you, um, I do appreciate Councilor Smith just mentioning the, the timeline and, and uh, I respect and can support um, that this would go back to the striking committee. Um, I, I do hope that um, consideration will be will be provided uh, for the points raised, and I think outlined in the in the minutes as well as to not lose that traction. Um, and and I I appreciate uh, I think it was Councillor Smith uh, who earlier touched on um, the original intent of this committee was a uh, fundraising strategy committee, and and they um, are, are members that. Um, that volunteered for this committee have, have strengths or experience and, and or our passion to do so. And so I, I find that um, very important. Um, and then I also want to, um, you know, the, the notion of taking the pulse of our community groups or our user groups is not to um, disrespect or, or erase the work of the former committee, which, which, um, which Donnie chaired uh, the ad hoc committee, I think it was just to, to update it. Um, so I, I, I would like to think that, that we would be able to do something with our existing committee, something meaningful, um, something that, you know, these guys want to see the development out there as much as what we do. Um, so I, I do hope that it's turned around uh, in, in a time frame that we can, that we can work with. So I, I do appreciate that. I think that uh, council can have confidence that the members of the striking committee are well-versed on this particular issue and uh, motivated in the ways that uh, you've just described. Not me, uh, the, uh, the rest of the members of the striking committee are well first. And, uh, and so I think uh, there's no question we'll come back with uh, something um, uh, both I think workable for council and, uh, and quickly. So uh, um, I would, uh, somebody would make a motion to refer to the striking committee. I could entertain that. Councilor Grace. Making that motion, moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Mayette. All in favor of the motion to refer. That's carried. Okay. So actually, oh yeah, sorry, that was moved by Grace and Mayette, right? Grace Mayette. Okay. So then that moves us on to uh, bylaws, and we have one bylaw, um, and uh, I'll read it. It's uh, 
uh, resolved that the following bylaws are hereby read a first, uh, second, and third time, and finally passed and sealed this 22nd day of March 2021, 1 15 2021, being a bylaw to adopt the municipal budget and to provide for the final tax levy and collection of rates and levies for the town of Saugeen Shores for the year 2021, and to provide for the mailing of notices demanding payment of taxes for the year 2021, and to provide for penalties and interest, and 2 16 2021, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meetings of the corporation of the town of Saugeen Shores. This is a remover and second. Secondary. Moved by Mats and second by Carr. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all favor. That's carried. All right, and that moves us on to adjournment. And I have a motion that this regular council meeting of March 22nd, 2021, hereby adjourns at 9 11 p.m. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Matson, second by Carr. All in favor? We stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good